Good evening. I would like to call to order the June 4th, 2018 Lake Washington School Board meeting. So we will let the record show that all board members are present. Um, and I would now like to entertain a motion to approve the June 4th agenda. So moved. Second. It has been moved by Director La Liberty and seconded by Director Carlson that we approve the agenda. All those in favor, please signify by voting aye. 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 All those opposed? Hearing none, motion carries. So tonight, we have the pleasure of having recognitions. And so at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Pierce and she will introduce the next. Great. We have a number of uh, recognitions this evening and we're gonna start with uh, our PTSA. And so I would like to uh, welcome Lake Washington PTSA President Liz Hedreen uh, to uh, introduce her team who's here and uh, talk a little bit about the, the scholarships. Hi, Liz. Hi, hello. <laughs> How's that? I won't stand too close. Is that better? Um, hi, um, I'm Liz Hadreen, as Tracy said, president for the Lake Washington PTSA Council. Uh, PTSA Council is like a PTSA board for the entire school district, and our council is comprised of um, it was 41 PTAs until the spring, and now we have two brand new PTAs. So we have 43 PTAs um, in our school district. Um, so I would just like to welcome all of you. Welcome um, to our outstanding students, and welcome to our families. Um, thank you all for coming, and um, I'd just like to give a special thank you to um, the school board for allowing us to um, participate in their meeting. Uh, but I want to do a special thank you to the parents of these scholarship winners. Um, it takes a lot of support and help and love and all kinds of things to raise a child up to the point where they achieve at this level. So we'd really like to recognize um, everything that you have done for your children and, and what your children are, are doing for our community. Um, our scholarships um, are funded by all of our PTAs make a donation every year to our scholarship fund. They all donate a basket that we have a big basket auction in the fall and thank you to the district for allowing us to take over their entire lobby for our basket auction and also the district employees um, heavily purchase our baskets so thank you to all the employees. <laughs> but if you've never been here in November you should come because it's a lot of fun. There's a lot of great baskets. Um, our scholarship is also funded by the Lake Washington Education Association and from private donations. So thank you to all those organizations for making this um, possible. Um, this year, for the first time, we're partnering with the Lake Washington Schools Foundation, and we're really excited about that. Um, Larry Wright, I think, is going to do a little bit of introducing later on and, and giving out some scholarships. Um, and I just want to uh, say something we're excited about this year. The last couple of years, we've revamped the scholarship program. Um, last year, we, we added some scholarships. And this year, I'm excited to say that we have increased our scholarship amount from $1,000 to 1250 And we wish that it could be an even larger number, but we're, we're working on it in increments. So um, anyway, thank you all for coming here. It's an exciting evening. It's an exciting time of life for, for the kids and for the parents. Um, and with that, I would like to introduce Irene Newman. She is our outstanding scholarship chair. So, here she is. Thank you, Liz, that's very high praise. <laughs> Good evening, school board and superintendent, Dr. Pierce. So, thank you for hosting us here this evening. Um, and I wanted to do, just before we get started with the program, a shout out to our judges who might be here in the room. If you could just raise your hands, I want to say thank you for all your work. We did have over 100 scholarship applications to judge and go through, and um, it was truly our privilege and honor to do that. So thank you for your hard work. All right, so here we go. The council awards two staff scholarship uh, scholarships for teaching, teachers pursuing continuing education district professional development courses or national board certification. We are pleased to announce our two recipients. And if you will please come up when you hear your name, Eleanor Jones 
is in her fourth year teaching at Thoreau Elementary uh, in a two-thirds uh, quest position. She has begun her master's degree in educational leadership through the Lake Washington School District cohort and is herself an active member of the PTSA. Mwah, let me just say, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so go on ahead. Thank you. Congratulations. Steve Okun is in his 11th year of teaching art at Redmond High School and is a powerful advocate for his students, arranging for student work to be exhibited throughout the state. He is pursuing his national board certification renewal. Congratulations. I think he couldn't be here with us tonight. So now on to our student awards. As we name you, uh, please come up to the front, shake Liz's hand, and stay. <laughs> and um, audience, we'll go ahead and please hold our applause uh, to the end. So, and because we're going to do a big photo at the end. The L.E. Scar Scholarship goes to Nicholas Woolwine at Lake Washington High School. Come on up, Nick. Nicholas is an active member in band and theater tech, as well as Key Club and several others. An honors student, he is also known by teachers for helping other students around him be successful. Nicholas will pursue a music technology degree in digital engineering at Shoreline Community Colleges starting in the fall. Next are merit awards for students planning to become educators. The Lake Washington Education Association's Karen Bates Scholarship goes to Daniel Leo of Redmond High School. Daniel is a math Olympiad, <laughs> the most coveted goal in the realm of competition mathematics and has received many other math awards, too many to mention here. But he is also an active community volunteer, serving on the Redmond Youth Partnership Advisory Committee and is a math club coach at Redmond Middle School. Daniel will be attending MIT in the fall. Our Jane Waranga scholarship goes to Jamie Ellen Hudson of Juanita High School. Jamie has been a peer tutor in the transition program there and is rightfully proud of the 4.0 GPA she has maintained her senior year. Jamie has worked as a day camp counselor at a children's theater and has always pursued opportunities to gain life experience. Jamie wants to continue making a difference for all kids and will be attending Eastern Washington University in the fall. Next, I would like to introduce Yumna Green to announce our merit recipients. Yumna serves on the council uh, board and will be taking over for me as scholarship chair next year. Thank you, Irene. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. The first merit scholar um, is from the East Lake Learning Community. His name is Isaac John Perrin. Isaac's time at Tesla STEM is marked by strong academics, AP classes, and a commitment to excel. Some of his honors achievements include the Presidential Environmental Youth Award and the SpaceX Hyperloop competition at the University of Washington, where he now works as a member of their mechanical engineering team. He will be attending the California Institute of Technology in the fall. Our second merit scholar from East Lake Learning Community is Divya Perini. Divya is not only an excellent student, but she has also excelled in extracurricular activities like drama, tennis, and honor society. In addition, she has received multiple awards for her participation in DECA. She has been active in, and most recently has served as the president of, Congressman Dave Reichert's Youth Advisory Board. Divya will be attending the University of California, Berkeley in the fall. Our next merit scholar is from the Redmond Learning Community, and that's Anna Wang. Anna is described as a student who has a passion for learning. She's president of ASB at Redmond High School and a member of several other school clubs. Her academic achievements include National Merit Finalist, AP Scholar, and American Association of University Women Scholar. She placed second in the Microsoft Hackathon for co-creating a program aimed at encouraging young girls to become interested in the world of STEM. 
Anna will be attending Harvard in the fall. Our next merit scholar is also from the Redmond Learning Community, and her name is Kushi Manish Chowdhury. Kushi has strong leadership skills. She teaches karate, is the president of the Model UN Club at Redmond High School, is the DECA events director at her high school, and leads the speech and debate team. Outside of school, she serves on the Redmond Teen Youth Advisory Board and has completed several projects associated with Microsoft and the University of Washington, where she will be attending in the fall. <clears throat> Our next merit scholarship is to a student from the Juanita Learning Community, and her name is Shadi Mervarzan. Shadi has a history of academic excellence and strong leadership. She maintained a 4.0 GPA throughout high school while enrolled in the rigorous Cambridge program. Her list of awards for volunteering, academics, and playing the piano is impressive. In addition, she's an athlete, a tutor, a founding member of the Girls Who Code Club at her high school, and a co-founder of Junior Model United Nations for sixth graders in Lake Washington School District's Quest program. Shadi will be attending Dartmouth College in the fall. Our next Merit Scholar is also from Juanita Learning Community, and her name is Jessica Wells. Jessica's achievements are exceptional and unique. For example, she was one of only five students selected to represent the state of Washington at the Bank of America Student Leader Program. She has served as an award-winning student leader in numerous organizations, including the City of Kirkland's Human Services Advisory Committee. She has a strong history of service to her community and, is, and a continued desire to empower and uplift the less fortunate among us. Jessica will be attending the University of Iowa Tippy School of Business. Our next candidate is from the Lake Washington Learning Community, and her name is Michelle Um. Michelle is described as highly intelligent with outstanding interpersonal skills. In the Running Start program at Bellevue College, she has been honored as a National Merit Finalist. That has not kept her from being an active Lake Washington High School student in orchestra, math club, key club, environmental club, and many more. She is passionate about the environment and wants to pursue a career in environmental engineering. Michelle is attending the University of Washington in the fall. Our final merit scholarship goes to a student in the Lake Washington Learning Community, and his name is Bryce Charles Klinker. Bryce is described by one of his teachers as one of the finest young men I have met in my journey as an educator. Some of his key achievements include scholar athlete, AP scholar with distinction, and a certificate of appreciation for service from the City of Kirkland's Board of Commission. Bryce has a strong commitment to community service and has been an active member of a school's varsity golf team, DECA, and Key Club. He will attend the University of Southern California in the fall. Thank you very much. Congratulations to all of our recipients. And, thank you. And at this point, I'd like to turn the mic over to the Lake Washington PTSA Council Vice President for Programs, Brandy Comstock. Thank you all for coming tonight. And I have the distinct pleasure of awarding the Perseverance Turnaround and At-Large Scholarships for our Council. The Perseverance Scholarship is awarded to a student that has persevered through a significant life challenge, and they self-select. So this year, our Perseverance Scholarship is awarded to Eastlake High School student Lucas Jeffrey Wall. Lucas has maintained a 4.0 GPA with his AP classes and is a member of the National Honor Society. He's also on the soccer team and chess club with over 200 hours of volunteer service. And he's a National Merit Commended Scholar. In the fall, Lucas is attending Western Washington University. 
we have our turnaround scholarship, and this scholarship is awarded to a student that has demonstrated a remarkable improvement turned around their academic career. And so we're very happy to award that to Callie Rose Benson. And Callie is interested in studying nursing, and she's committed to go to Washington State University in the fall. She is a Juanita STEM student and a dedicated, accomplished volleyball player. Her resilience and grit in the face of obstacles has been rewarded with an impressive two-point improvement, full two points in her GPA. Those who know Callie best describe her as kind, caring, positive, dedicated, loyal, and motivated. All of these will serve her well as a nurse. And our last award for tonight is awarded in honor of a person who has helped our council with her friendship, her leadership, her dedication, and her years of service as a superintendent. So we'd like to award tonight's at-large scholarship in honor of Dr. Tracy Pierce. <laughs> And our recipient to the at-large scholarship is going to Bradley Ross Cagle. So Bradley has received recognition and numerous awards for his academic and athletic achievements. You can read about them in your program. He's first in his class at Redmond High School, another National Merit Commended Scholar, captain of the football team, and in three years managed to do his 200 plus hours of volunteer work with one organization. So this fall, Bradley will be attending the University of Washington, where he hopes to eventually go on to medical school. So thank you. Congratulations. Good evening, everybody. I'm Larry Wright. I'm the executive director of the Lake Washington Schools Foundation. And I'd like to thank the board and the superintendent for letting us take some time. Congratulations to all the scholarship recipients. And as Brandy and Irene were noting, the Lake Washington Schools Foundation this year partnered with PTSA Council to do two scholarships. These are two four-year scholarships at $2,500 a year, made possible by generous donation from the REMAC family. So I'd like to thank the REMACs for their generosity. Yeah. Our first scholar is Tyler Zangaglia. Tyler, come on up. So I'd also like to introduce um, Tim Campbell and uh, Sarah Stone from our board. So Tyler is in the East Lake community, and um, if you live in the East Lake community or if you live in the Lake Washington School District, the chances are you've run across Tyler before. He's involved in any number of community projects. He's served as ASB vice president, class president, key club, East Lake Res Senate representative, and uh, he was in the Random Acts of Kindness Club. He managed uh, to maintain a high GPA while working and volunteering for some Amish Rotary. He's best known for founding the Hope Festival, a nonprofit which serves those experiencing poverty and homelessness. And Tyler is attending Gonzaga in the fall and I believe going into business, hopefully. Yeah, great. Congratulations, Tyler. <laughs> Our second recipient is Scott Kavanaugh. Scott is a graduating senior from Tesla STEM. Uh, Scott is a he's managed to maintain a 3.9 GPA that includes taking AP classes, orchestra, safe ambassadors, physics, and philosophy clubs. If that weren't impressive enough, Scott did this all while undergoing testing and treatment for some physical ailments. Scott, in fact, was so passionate about helping others that he testified in front of an FDA advisory panel in Washington, D.C. that led to the approval of a treatment in the United States for others. So Scott will be attending uh, the University of Washington in, in the fall and I believe going into engineering. Is that right, Scott? Yeah, so congratulations to phenomenal young men. We'll just take a few moments here for some photo opportunities. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, yeah, let's go ahead and have you squeeze in. <laughs> Thank you. 
two rows, and then the parents come up and take pictures. It's simple. Yes. If you can see over the person next to you, step behind them. There we go. Perfect. Now, parents, come on up and take a decent picture. can't see the camera, the camera can't see you. We should get a picture of the parents taking pictures, it's so cute. With that, we will let our uh, school board <laughs> tend to their business for the evening. Um, and if you haven't sent me your photo release, please sign it in the back and leave it for me. Um, and thank you so much. This concludes our program. We really appreciate you all being here this evening to celebrate with us. Thank you. Excuse me, one more thing. Oh, oh sorry. Go ahead. Can, can we have all the students go outside for one more photo? We felt like we could do one, one better. But Thank before, you. Before, before you go, um, just a couple of quick things. First, uh, if you're a parent here with a student tonight, could you stand up? Parent, grandparent. Yeah, a family member. <laughs> We want to thank uh, the parents and uh, families for sending us such outstanding uh, students and really congratulate all of the students um, on your amazing accomplishments. And there's one other quick recognition uh, that we want to do before you step out in the hall. Uh, first, uh, Liz. <laughs> want to say a big thank you uh, to Liz Hadrine for her leadership of the District PTSA Council this past year. Uh, you've been uh, two years. Amazing to work with and um, thank you for all of your service to our schools and our families and students. That hanging basket there behind you is for you, Liz. And I also uh, want to uh, again congratulate uh, you and Irene and Jay and uh, Swarnima. Irene, we have corrected the spelling of your last name. Uh, we uh, recognized our family and community engagement uh, group from Lake Washington PTSA. They were recognized um, for their outstanding community leadership and contributions, contributions to the improvement improvement of public education and uh, we gave them the community leadership award through uh, WASA this past year. So here's your corrected plaque. Thank you so much <laughs> for your service. <laughs> Thank you all very much, and congratulations to all the students um, and the parents and staff and all the above in getting that great accomplishment. So we will continue with additional recognitions this evening to go on to speak about our innovation program. Great, yeah, so we're really excited because this is the first year of our innovation program and our Director of Innovation, uh, Choice Accelerated Programs and Innovation, Heather Sanchez is here uh, to say a few words about the program, which is a program that we are able to implement in conjunction with our Lake Washington Schools Foundation. So welcome, Heather. Okay, there we go. <laughs> wow, what an amazing group of students. That's a tough act to follow. <laughs> but I'm pleased to be here uh, this evening. Um, thank you, ladies and gentlemen of the board, Dr. Pierce, honored guests, community members. Uh, my name is Heather Sanchez, Director of Accelerated Programs, Choice and Innovation. And we are here this evening to celebrate the innovative programs in our school district. We have a group of schools that have been trying some really exciting things this spring, and so we're here to celebrate their work. So I have just, I have a couple of things that I'm going to want to show you up here. So I'm going to go ahead and get logged on here. All right, and so switching it to this. There we go. I 
maybe. Okay, there we go. Um, it is my distinct uh, honor and pleasure to be able to share a little bit with you about our innovation programs here in the Lake Washington School District. And I'll open by saying that so many of our schools, I would say every school, has innovative practices and does creative things in their school. And to extend those opportunities, we've been doing some work this spring, and we have some schools that have been trying some new and bold ideas. And so the purpose of our innovative programs here, So we grounded, we grounded this journey in our purpose as a district and our mission and vision. And we embarked on this journey earlier this year, really last spring at this time. And we put out the opportunity for all of the schools in our district to apply for an innovation grant. This is the slide that the principals looked at in November. We spent some time with our principals and all the schools had the opportunity to come up with a great and innovative, unique idea for their school in alignment to their continuous improvement plan. They worked, principals worked with their school teams to develop this idea. They wrote a grant. It was submitted to a team, a representative team that reviewed the applications. And the rubric that we used was based primarily off of the Washington Innovative Schools rubric. And they were notified in January of who got money. They got their money and they were off to the races implementing their programs. And so they're in various stages of implementation at this point. You'll see some are further along than others. Everybody's embarked on the journey. And so I am so pleased this evening to have the opportunity to share with you all and with our school board some of the exciting work that's happening. And so these are the schools that received program funny, funding. We have Ben Rush Elementary School, Family Engagement to Support Math Education, Einstein Elementary School, their PAL program, Lake Washington High School's Urban Gardening Program, Lake Washington Learning Community had two grants, one for a computer science leadership program, one for a STEM symposium, and one for a Comunidad Matemática, Math Community, Rockwell Elementary had an outdoor education program grant. Sandberg, Creating Innovators, and Thoreau, Attacking the Gap. Those are the titles. And we're going to have a video here where you'll get to see a little bit about what this looks like at their schools in action. But before I do that, I'm going to ask those schools and their teams to just stand so we can see where you are, please. All of these schools. And then after our video clip, they'll come up and have just a brief um, moment to share with, with the board and with everybody here this evening what's been most exciting about their innovative grant. But before I do that, I don't know if Larry, I think Larry might be outside, but um, this wouldn't have been possible without the partnership of the Lake Washington Schools Foundation. Uh, the funds to make these grants possible was in partnership with the, our school district and the foundation. And we're extraordinarily um, grateful and thankful for that. And so we owe them a big thanks. And on that note, let's watch the video. interesting, exciting things at our school sites. That he keeps hitting something up. I think it's always important that we grow as educators. The power of letting schools say, hey, we want to try something. Trying things that are new is important. We should always be doing those things. So what do you think is happening in this? I think it's such a great thing that like Washington School District joined together with the foundation and created an innovation grant. We started doing this program. How about we add all of it together? Comunidad Matemática, which is Spanish for math community. We noticed that there was a need to support a certain group of students who needed a little bit of additional support. And so we were thinking, what's a different way that we could approach supporting these kids? Our focus this year is really looking into how can we make these kids feel confident, see themselves as scholars, see themselves as somebody who is capable of doing math and seeing a purpose for math. I, I don't know that they knew what it was going to be, and I'm not sure that we did either, but what it's turned into being is something that is 
I think, loud and engaging and fun. Oh, you literally added them up? I think that they're learning and changing their perceptions of math almost in spite of themselves. So I'd like to welcome you to the site of the future Rockwell Elementary Outdoor Education Classroom. This was the vision of one of the fourth grade teachers and I, with the idea being that with the new next generation science standards, a lot of this is hands-on and it's about scientific process. And so to get kids interacting and moving with the natural environment is going to be great. We'll have music classes out here performing. Uh, we'll have classes out here doing um, readers workshop performances. So it's going to be a space used by all of our students. This is going to inspire kids to learn, to be hands-on, to see that science is a real life endeavor. This is going to be a great experience for kids and it will positively impact 650 kids every single day. So your job as architects today, as you're building your castles. The Innovation Grant is passionate about learning. We're calling it our PAL grant. It is a grant to provide a time uh, hopefully once a week for all students to be able to choose uh, something that they are interested in learning more about. Simple machines are used to... We have students that may not be able to participate in STEM activities outside of school. So we're trying to build that into our day to where they can actually have these hands-on experiences with STEM activities that they might not get a chance to do otherwise. We're hoping that what they're getting is a love of learning. And, and an understanding that all of these pieces that they learn every day in school can be applied to other learning. So instead of sitting there looking at a book or watching a video, um, they're actually building, they're actually using their imaginations. They're doing things that are higher level thinking, but also fun at the same time for them. Everything shows that parent involvement in the school will just help support our students. We wrote the grant to do two things. One was to increase the um, parent involvement in our school, and the second one was to increase math enrichment at home for our first grade students. We have a group of parents who comes in the last Wednesday of every month to help us put together math games that go home with our first grade students. We provide busing for those parents to come in because we found that some of our parents really Really didn't know how to come in and volunteer, didn't know what opportunities there were at school. Nice. We wrote the grant to do one game for our first graders every month. But after the first time that we had parents here, we had this huge participation, and so we've actually expanded it. And every month we're now making games for kindergarten through second grade. We absolutely want to have parents come in and sort of feel like they're part of the school. We want to make sure that they are building community there, so they are meeting other families as well, and they're feeling like they're really contributing to uh, here at Ben Rush, and they are. It has been a fabulous program that has been more successful than I could have ever thought. The Innovation Grant, I call it STEM Symposiums. Essentially what a STEM Symposium is, is a science fair. We need to be innovative in the way that we approach science fairs because science is changing, the way that we learn science is changing, and we need to match all of what we do to then fit that 21st century model. And so for a traditional science fair, it's you've got your science board, you've got your volcano, you've got the, you know, the stuff that you put in it, and then it comes out and that's your science fair project. The volcano's been in existence for hundreds of years and we still continue to use the same thing. The main thing that I want them to get out of it is that they can do so much more than just a board. Um, that they can figure out what their interests are, and it could be around coding, it could be around engineering, it doesn't have to be around the scientific method. And so I want to build student interest, um, and I want to get kids encouraged to then, to then think about these projects they're doing for these STEM symposiums, and then build interest towards electives in middle school. We want to push kids to go beyond what has already been done and to try new things. We have read this story several times. The grant was written in order to send two teacher leaders out to the International Literacy Association conference. We knew looking at the what was offered at this particular conference was very strategic to 
what the goals of the district were. I think that going to the conference was important because they were addressing equity, which is something I'm really passionate about, through literacy. I love the strategies that we got and it was very inspiring. There were people that had some very compelling research and also some thought-provoking statistics around literacy. I'm seeing growth. Just we went to the conference and we came back and we are sharing our knowledge and strategies with other teachers. Staff are excited. They love the practical application. They love the fact that they have specific strategies that they can use right away with students. It's important to always be learning from the professionals and also learning from each other about what works best. For this grant, I'm hoping to start a horticulture program here at LDUB, starting small with an urban gardening class that focuses on being able to grow and maintain crops in small and creative spaces. Uh, as you can see right now, it's not quite ready for uh, a classroom yet, um, but what ultimately we'd like to have is maybe a couple more raised beds, either as big as this one or we could even do a few smaller ones. We can use the areas that are currently concrete for a container planting and container gardening. I'm excited because I feel like this is unexplored territory here at LDUB. Uh, we don't have any gardening programs in our CTE department yet. Um, and I think it's really important for kids just to see, like your food doesn't just come from the grocery store. It comes from somewhere. Someone's put love and care into the process of growing and maintaining and cultivating what you eat. And I think it's, it would be eye-opening for kids to be able to see that and experience that. We have teams of four teachers at Rush and Rose Hill and Lakeview. We didn't ask the question what... And they will be learning about computer science and computational thinking and then making those leaps to then do activities with their kids. And take a minute to discuss the... We have a, a group activity, so we get together and work through that. It's usually learning the skills behind technology, so it's not necessarily using the technology, but learning the computational thinking that's required for, in order to teach the students that kind of thinking. So when you jump, you skip a space. It's important jump. to know the skills yeah, slightly great. before teaching the kids so I can help explain it to them, but then we're all learning it together, which makes it more authentic, and it just brings our classroom community together as well. And these are <laughs> teachers that are taking their time to then go through this Here. professional development. Show her how to build the code. And then work with kids on all the different things that they're learning. So we talk a lot about grit and just try something. If it doesn't work, then try something else. So the computational thinking really says, like, if it doesn't work, just figure out what's wrong. Try it again, try it again. You know, it, it's not a failure. It's just one step towards the right answer. You put it all in the same water, the energy doesn't know where she goes. The big picture, getting kids to work collaboratively in order to problem solve, in order to think creatively. Because like all these have different ones. Our innovation grant is all around STEM project kits. So the idea is we build these boxes that have all the tools in them that teachers then take. They can check them out, they can use them with their class. Benjamin, take your STEM kit. Um, we wanted to create something that had different levels of implementation for teachers, but also we wanted STEM kits that would reach kids of all ages, different levels of experience for students. These STEM kits kind of help teachers very quickly and very easily create an ex a learning experience that their students can kind of um, use in other subjects. We want kids to have endless possibility and these sorts of projects the innovation that comes with them helps kids expand their vision of what's possible for them in their future. So as you can see, the, when, we, when we started this work, we weren't entirely sure what sort of grant applications were going to come in. And as you can see, we got this wide array of very innovative ideas that improve um, equity of learning outcomes and innovative environments for all students. So uh, it's been such exciting work. And on that note, I'm going to hear in just a moment have each school come up and just share a couple sentences in their own words with you about what's been most exciting to them about this work. But before I do that, I would like to show you one more thing. So unveiling tonight, the programs don't know that this is going to happen. We have developed a bag.
badge that's gonna go on each of your websites. So I'm going to show you what it's going to look like. And it's not there yet, but it will be tomorrow. <laughs> we didn't want any peeking. <laughs> so, but I'm, I'm gonna show you, it is on one page. Um, so while I'm pulling that up, I also just wanna take a moment to, thanks, to thank John Knorr, who does an amazing job with these videos, and he's in editing. <laughs> John, we know you're back there, we love you. Okay, so if you go to the innovation page, there, see that nifty badge? That lives on the innovation main page and for each of your schools, it will now live on your school web page with a hyperlink here and we are in the process, we'll put that highlight video that you all just saw up here, but then there's longer videos that are under development, some of them are done that will also be a longer version. So it's just a way to celebrate and recognize the work that, that you all have done. So there you go, ta-da, it'll be on your webpage tomorrow morning. Okay, so on that note. <laughs> all right, so we're just gonna go alphabetical order. So what I'm going, what I've, what I've asked them to do is to um, have the principal and or the representative who's here come up and share just a couple sentences about what's most exciting. So I think if we could switch off of this and back to the camera so we can see their smiling faces. And so first up we have Ben Rush Elementary School, Principal Lucy Davies and Entourage. Good evening. I have with me here Megan Bernicki, who is our EL teacher, who is also a big part of organizing this grant. Um, so the most exciting thing is we had more than 40 um, parents and grandparents who volunteered for the first time um, at the school through this uh, opportunity and they made over 1,200 math games that we sent home with students at our school. So not only did we increase that family engagement and those parents coming into our school, um, but we also had that homeschool connection and provided opportunities for students to continue that math learning at home. I told them a couple sentences or a minute, so they're being very... <laughs> Okay, next we have Einstein Elementary School, Principal Robin Imai and, and friends. So I thought that it would be great to hear from our kids about what they thought about our program. So I have two of our fabulous and amazing students here, uh, Nathaniel and Arav, and they have prepared a little statement for you. Let's start. Sorry, and this is Nathaniel. Innovation time is a win for kids because it is a break from hard work that we have all done this week. And we are still learning stuff, things like coding, building castles with Legos. Second, it's fun. It's a great idea because you get you get the freedom to pick what you want to do, like building simple machines. Thank you. And this is Arav. Good evening, everybody. My name is Arav Kulkarni, and I'm from Albert Einstein Elementary. Today, I'm here to talk to you about design time. Design time helps us learn new ideas, brainstorm ideas, and work in groups. I love building things and playing with technology to make our lives easier. When an LWSD student is on the TV show Shark Tank presenting his or her new great invention, we will be, th we'll be thanking Design Time. Oh my goodness. <laughs> So the Lake, Washi Lake Washington High School was unable to be here this evening, but they did leave a couple of sentences for me to share with you all. So Lake Washington High School uh, is, has received a grant to develop an urban gardening program. And so this is from Jessica Butterfield, the teacher that you saw on the video, who shares the following. We're so excited to start a horticulture program at LDUB next year. This is a win for our kids because our goal is to empower students with the skills to grow their own produce, no matter the space constraints using sustainable practices. Thank you. Thank you. 
All right, next we have Associate Principal Trent Negebauer, who's going to talk about both of the grants for the Lake Washington Learning Community. All right, so I'm, I'm going to cheat because I have two, so I'm going to read a little bit. Uh, the most exciting aspect of the computational thinking program is that we are creating knowledgeable teacher leaders who will bring their newfound expertise and passion into the classroom. Teachers will use the training to help all students, K-5, get exposure to computer science and give them the confidence to continue to take STEM-related classes in middle school and beyond. Then for the STEM Symposium, the most exciting aspect of the STEM Symposium program is that we will be helping students and families see science and science fairs in a new light, where there will be opportunities for all sorts of different STEM-related projects. Students will also see firsthand that there are many opportunities for them in the future with STEM careers if they continue to take classes and stay interested in solving problems in our world. Okay, next we have Redmond Elementary School Principal Kirsten Gomez, who's going to talk a little bit about, and, and teachers with her, to talk about Comunidad Matematica. Hi, um, I'm here with Megan Weenan, who got married this year, and I'm still learning how to say her last name. I did it. Um, and Morgan Seymour, who are two instructors for the program. Uh, this was a win for everybody. It was a win for us because I think every time we got together, it reminded us why we got into education. It was really fulfilling and meaningful and fun. Um, and the important part about this program was the community aspect, um, which I don't know if it was in that video. We partnered with Redmond Middle School to identify middle schoolers who were, some of them strong in math and some of them working on their math skills, and then brought them back down and they partnered with our instructors and did cooperative, collaborative, um, collective learning. And that's why it was so loud. And the win for the kids was I think the win for the middle schoolers was having that role of mentoring and then strengthening their skills in the process. And the win for the kids was that they really started to see themselves as learners in a community of mathematicians. Um, and the win for one of our kids was the chocolate muffins we had one day for snack. So <laughs> that was a win too. Okay, next we get to hear from Rockwell Elementary School Principal Michael Clark and teacher who's going to tell us about their outdoor education classroom. Hello, I'm teacher. <laughs> uh, so we yeah, haven't had the classroom built yet, but we're super excited. I, I really believe that uh, an education that doesn't include the natural world that we all live in is, is fundamentally incomplete, especially in a, a society where kids are inclined, and teachers are inclined to spend a lot of time in front of screens. Um, and so having this opportunity to connect with nature and take learning outside is uh, super exciting for us and we're really grateful for the grant. Thank you very much. Next, we have joining us Lori Pierce, principal of Sandberg Discovery Community School to talk about creating innovators. So our goal at Sandberg and DCS, we talk a lot about creating possibilities and showing kids that there are endless possibilities in the world. And so our goal with the STEM kits is really to collect a variety of learning materials that are all hands-on, but teach them those creative problem-solving skills, working collaboratively, and having a stance of inquiry to really engage them in understanding what the possibilities are for their future. So that's our plan. And last but certainly not least, we have Carrie Levinson, principal of Thoreau Elementary School, speaking to their Attacking the Gap grant. Thank you. Um, Heather, thank you to the board and Dr. Pierce for having us. And um, Heather asked us tonight to talk sort of of next steps and what's happened since you saw the video. And I think you saw my teachers getting trained and what has happened since then is they've taken this into their classroom. And what I've noticed as I've been in classrooms every day is a lot more visible learning. I can see what the kids are learning and they see it and it translates into student voice, which is always difficult to elicit at an elementary school level. 
Um, usually when we give a survey to kids to get student voice, they all put that happy face because everything's great when you're a first grader. But we really wanted to hear from them like what their school experience is like and to understand more the why behind our gaps so that we can come about them in multiple ways and not just um, the same old thing which produces the same results. And we're starting to really see um, kids learning in a new way and that's translating into higher Dibble scores and we're hopeful for higher SBA scores and things like that. But ultimately, it's just the joy of the kids learning every single day in the classroom. Thank you. And again, it's just been, this has been such invigorating and exciting work that these schools have been engaged in. And uh, we just appreciate the time to be able to celebrate their work. And uh, another big round of applause for all of the schools and all of their work. Thank you. Amazing, thank you so much. We have one more very special recognition this evening and I would like to invite Rockwell Principal, Mr. Michael Clark, uh, forward to the podium for the next recognition. All right, well thank you so much Tracy. So my name is Michael Clark and I'm proud to be the principal of Rockwell Elementary where every day we give our beagle best and where every day we foster kindness, empathy, and global literacy. And Rockwell fifth grade teacher Julian Cortez is at the forefront of that important work. Julian is a graduate of Juanita High School and he's a testament to our district mission and vision. He's a gifted teacher who fills the students' days with rigorous instruction, engagement, and humor. Julian works to build community and a positive culture in his classroom, and I see the results of that every single day. He's an educator who works from an equity lens, and his students know that he genuinely cares about them, both as scholars and individuals. Uh, one might say he's even an award-winning educator. So I would like to introduce Julian Cortez, who will introduce his family. you. <laughs> oh, geez, okay. Um, th this was supposed to be really easy. Um, 19 years ago, I moved to this country, and, uh, and the people that are responsible for that are my parents. Um, when I came here, I didn't speak English. I felt alone, and I felt left out. Um, and it's such a huge honor to be standing here uh, in front of the board and everyone else here uh, to introduce my parents and, and tell them thank you for bringing me here and for believing in me and challenging me every day. Um, thank you to my wife for supporting me, everybody, my family, my amazing friends from work that are here, um, and my kids. I have three of my kids that are crazy enough to come here and say hello. Um, and probably the person that led me to this career, to choosing to become a teacher, uh, was my third grade teacher, Mrs. Pellet. <laughs> um, thank you, because I wouldn't, I wouldn't be standing up here if it wasn't for you. Um, and thank you, Michael, for, for the nomination. This is a huge honor. And I want to say real quick that um, all these great things that you guys are planning on doing with your schools are, are phenomenal. And the kids that we saw up here getting those awards, I'm so happy and proud of them. Um, but none of that could be possible if people didn't care about each other, uh, if we didn't show kindness and empathy. And, and that's my goal um, as an educator is to spread that message. So let's continue showing kindness and empathy to, to each other and everybody. Thank you. <laughs> And so I'd like to uh, introduce some guests who are with us today from the Washington State ASCD, Carrie Lamb and Dr. Forrest Greek. All right, thank you for having us, uh, members of the board. Dr. Pierce, thank you. And uh, Julian, uh, simply put, you're a rock star. 
and that's why we chose you. Um, pretty much what you've said has captured just about everything. We select educators for this award because they, they value and know whole education for the whole child. You clearly demonstrate a, that every day. Obviously, your family knows that. Your significant other knows that. Your kids and, of course, your colleagues. And, of course, us at ASD do do. So thank you and congratulations on behalf of ASCD. Uh, this plaque, would, which commemorates this award, is for you. And then a $500 uh, gift certificate for Kaplan on behalf of Kaplan. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, well, thank you very much, and congratulations. It is exciting for all these recognitions that have come through this evening and the support that our community and the talented students and staff that we are lucky to have. Um, at this time, we will be moving on to public comment. Go ahead. Sorry, speaking as the STEM nerd on the board, I, um, well, one of the STEM nerds, um, I really wanted to say thank you for that video, uh, and the truth is, through that entire video, the most important piece of it was the little girl trying to put her scissors on a piece of paper and discovering that it didn't hold it up, because experiments that don't work are much more important than the experiments that do. So thank you so much. All right, any other comments? Okay. I have okay. one quick one. Go I ahead. just want to say that I've known Julian for quite some time, going way back to when you first came here, and I'm extremely impressed, but I had no doubt day. So at this point, before we move into public comment, I just wanted to let anybody who was interested, we're moving into our business meeting. For any of you who are interested, who might have other things they would like to do, you are welcome to leave at this moment in time. There's no problem. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, no, that's okay. If there's homework to be done. Um, you can always watch it on TV <laughs> afterwards, so we're always available through video. But thank you so much for coming. And with that, we will now move to public comment. We do have three individuals currently signed up. Um, I will just quickly run through, as you know, we provide public comment at the board meeting once a month. You can always send email, phone call, letters, any of the above, we'll also respond to those. Um, you have three minutes on your topic, and when your name is called, please come forward, and introduce yourself, as well as your school attendance area for the record. Um, just to remind you for all community members to feel welcome and safe during our business meeting. So we, we do not take public comments on issues related to personal personnel or individually named staff at board meetings. Audience members are expected to treat all attendees with respect and civility. And so going with that, the first person I have signed up to address the board is Susan Carollo. Hi, I'm Susan Carollo, and I live in the Eastlake Learning Community. I have two students at Eastlake High School, one at Inglewood Middle School and a first grader. I want to talk about equity and what has been shown effective in closing opportunity and achievement gaps for our marginalized students. Today has been a day of celebration and recognition for our high achieving students and staff. And I'm celebrating the whole month of June because my oldest daughter is participating in senior prom and baccalaureate and graduation. She is one of our district's high achieving students graduating with a long list of AP credits, a high GPA, and even some scholarship money. She's successful because she is hardworking and resilient, and she also comes with some characteristics that make her more likely to succeed in a school system. She's a white, upper-middle-class female without disabilities, mental health challenges, or a language barrier. She's always had access to enough food, shelter, and even yoga pants to feel prepared to come to school and learn. 
Opportunity and achievement gaps occur in populations where some of these advantages are lacking and our district has an equity team that's working on advising our schools how to close these gaps. Our team is focused on race and culture, but disability is another form of student diversity that is often forgotten in the discussions of equity and social justice. In the past, schools have tried helping students by identifying barriers to student success, such as racial bias, disability, and poverty, and then starting a program or a service for these students. Unfortunately, many of these programs end up removing kids from the general education classroom. This leaves the kids without challenges to benefit from a smaller class size and the high expectations of the general education curriculum. This perpetuates the iniquity that these separated students are experiencing and marginalizes them further. Separate classes and pull-out services result in students who do not feel like they belong to their community and drop out or underachieve. For example, my kindergarten daughter with disabilities had a proposed schedule last year that pulled her back and forth between settings eight times a day. Four were not even tied to a natural transition such as recess leading to 40 minutes of lost instructional time. In places where schools have brought supports and services to students in the general education classroom, achievement gaps have narrowed. Student, schools can choose universal design curriculum and merge funding to make supports available to everyone. Many resources exist already for transforming school systems from a focus on programs and pullout to a focus on equity and inclusion. Working with SWIFT schools, bringing inclusive consultants such as Dr. Costin, or even following the plan set out in this book, Leading for Social Justice, are all options. I would like to see our district um, choose leaders who are dedicated to closing these gaps through an inclusive and equitable system for all. Thank you. Thank you. So the next name we have is Dinah Karu Olson. Hi. Um, my name is Dinah Karu Olson, and I'm in the Lake Washington Learning Community. My daughter attends Twain Elementary. Envisioning the how of meaningful inclusion can sometimes be a difficult task. This difficulty exists because we often understand inclusion as a retrofit, something that should fit into or on the existing structure. However, meaningful inclusion is not an extra layer that we impose on the existing instructional practices or the environment. Inclusion is not a fad that neatly enters and then, as fads do, leaves the collective consciousness as fast as it entered. Inclusion is an integral part of a larger, well-established framework focused on the science of how all children learn, how they engage with instruction, and how they grow and develop to be the kinds of humans who create the kind of community we all strive for. This framework is called Universal Design for Learning or UDL, and it's the framework for ensuring that all students in Lake Washington School District are future ready. UDL draws, on, uh, draws from a variety of research, including the fields of neuroscience, the learning sciences, and cognitive psychology. And it is based upon the most widely replicated finding in educational research, that all learners are highly variable in their response to instruction. The defining principles of UDL are to give learners multiple means of representation, of expression, and of engagement. This means allowing for various ways of acquiring information, alternatives for demonstrating knowledge, and tapping into students' interests, offering appropriate challenges and increasing motivation. These principles are applicable to every student in the classroom. They help scaffold, yet challenge. They drive focus on learning and growth rather than management and compliance. These principles help find the value in student diversity and variability rather than considering it a barrier to learning. UDL is the path for real future readiness. It is the framework of equity and inclusion and of meaningful participation and belonging. So human rights answer the question of why inclusion. UDL answers the question of how. So, now, all that we're left with is, why not already? Um, inclusion is not specifically about my disabled child or what she needs. It's about all children, disabled and non-disabled alike. It is for everyone. It is about the community, about learning and growth, and about preparing students for their future, not preparing them for our past. Thank you. 
Thank you, and I haven't said this yet, but I would ask that if you could email your comments, again, I was just thinking of the, the resources that you mentioned, Susan, as well, so that would be helpful if you could email those. So please come for Maria. Well <laughs> Although I don't think I'm gonna do the last name. If you could, Bogic. Yeah. Okay. So just one quick second. It sounds like our video feed might not be working the way it needs to for people at home who might be watching. So we just want to confirm with that. It just cut out a minute ago or so. Up oh. <laughs> Start time. So we'll just take a moment's break in the meantime. Well, it's my bedtime, so. <laughs> Well, pretty late. <laughs> thanks for coming. <laughs> it helps to have someone home li listening. That's how I know. Oh, sorry. <laughs> that's how I know. My wife is watching. Oh, we'll have okay. this on our it's internal system. It's still working system. on our internal okay, system. So correct. Still, so we're still on yeah, video. Accessible. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. It will okay. be accessible. Yeah. It's. Yeah. yeah. So we're just taking a recess for a second till <clears> they come back and see if they can get us online. It is the joys of technology. All right, so what it sounds like is we are ready to go. So thank you for your patience and please begin. Thank you. Hi, my name is Maria Bogic and I am in the Juanita Learning Community. My daughter is successfully included in general education class at San Sandberg Elementary. Um, as has been established, inclusive education is le a legally supported, evidence-based best practice and as such, our clear way forward. So how do we get there? My intent today is to address one of the barriers, the pervasive myth of inclusive education as a costly endeavor, one that exceeds the costs of maintaining the traditional model of service delivery, a segregated or partially segregated education of disabled students. This is indeed a myth, a misunderstanding derived from the cost analysis of maintaining two parallel systems of special education an inclusive and, and a segregated one simultaneously. This misconception of the operational reality of inclusive education also reinforces existing practices that exclude many disabled students from the least restrictive environment, further helps create segregated educational settings and maintains the status quo. Today, we have substantial and compelling data that tells us that shifting systems to be inclusive rather than tackling meaning, meaningful inclusion one child at a time and leaving environments foundationally unchanged in the wake is a change, an evolution that needs to take place if we are to align with the values that the district subscribes to, all students future ready. As I'm sure you've heard, there is a district, Westland Wilsonville in Oregon, less than four hours drive from here, that has embraced meaningful inclusion as a fundamental value. As a byproduct of having intentionally made a shift in their infrastructure, as well as thinking, they now serve as evidence of the very reality that all students can be meaningfully included, that no one is armed by this approach, that in fact, everyone benefits and the outcomes are more positive, and that inclusion is not the costly resource drain that is often made out to be. Fortunately, as Westlin Wilsonville shows us, we don't have to be inclusion trailblazers. Westlin Wilsonville is simply one more resource in a fast growing and expansive body of knowledge that we can draw from and rely on. We don't have to reinvent the wheel, but shift our thinking instead. Separate is not equal. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, thank you very much for taking the time. Is there anybody else who would like to do public comment who did not sign up? 
All right, with that, we will then move on to the consent agenda. So I will now entertain a mo motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Second. It has been moved by Director Carlson and directed and seconded by Director La Liberty. So Dr. Pierce, will you please poll the board? Cassandra? Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me, Eric? Yes. Siri? Yes. Mark? Yes. Chris? Yes. And Dr. Pierce, will you please review the donations? <clears throat> Yes, if you turn to tab five, uh, we have a number of very generous donations this evening totaling $68,184. $4,389.90, I'll round up here, um, from Louisa May Alcott Elementary PTSA to Alcott Elementary. <clears throat> to purchase gym equipment, emergency supplies, and art supplies. $1,308 from Juanita Elementary PTA to Juanita Elementary to support field trips. $2,383 from Usborn Uz Books, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, and more uh, to Mann Elementary School to support the library. $2,893 from Rosa Parks PTSA to Rosa Parks Elementary to support field trips. $1,528 from Carl Sandburg PTSA to Sandburg Elementary to purchase art supplies. $9,144 from Laura Ingalls Wilder Elementary PTA, PTSA to Wilder Elementary School to provide stipends for math club, science club, and motor skills enrichment club. $19,006 from Evergreen Middle School PTSA to Evergreen Middle to provide stipends for Multicultural Science, Environmental, Math, Humanities, and Family Clubs, Robotics AVID, Webmaster, where everyone belongs, or Web, uh, Building Instructional Leadership Team and AV Media Support, and to support professional development. $4,098 from Redmond Middle School PTSA to Redmond Middle School to purchase table tennis tables. $1,052 from Eastlake High School Band Boosters to Eastlake High School to support band bus transportation. $2,641 from Eastlake Wolfpack Association and Eastlake Robotics Booster Club to Eastlake High School to support robotics. And $23,432 from International Community School PTSA to ICS to provide stipends for ASB Tech Crew, uh, FBLA, Mock Trial, Model UN, Honor Society, Safe Schools Ambassadors, Outdoor Education, uh, and a, a number of others uh, also to support uh, a curriculum review and professional development. So a number of things included in that donation. Again, all the donations this evening total $68,184. Well, thank you, and thank you to everybody who's chosen to support our students and schools. We greatly appreciate the generosity. Um, so our next item is going to be approval of our monitoring report for Executive Limitation 14 on technology. Um, as you know, this is part of our annual process of going through the 14 different executive limitations, um, and this looks at sort of the operational expectations of our organization. So I'm gonna go ahead and let Dr. Pierce take it from here. Great, so uh, tab six uh, is where you'll uh, see the recommendation and as per our process, uh, the board receives these uh, written reports well in advance uh, of the meeting this evening, providing the opportunity for to review the report and pose any questions. Uh, no questions have come from the board. Uh, per our typical process, if all areas of an executive limitation are in compliance, uh, there's, there's nothing that we tend to speak to at the meeting. All areas are in compliance, so the report's now being presented for approval. Okay, and on that, are there any further questions or clarifications that individuals might not have had the chance to send? I just had a quick question on the upgrade to the infrastructure, I guess, on... Um, I'm not a data expert, so bear with me. On our internet service, the speed of our internet service at our schools, specifically at the high schools, does the amount of time that it takes for a student to boot their laptop up have to do with the hardware and the incoming internet service speed, or is it 
more about the just the internet service speed? Just to clarify, is there a particular part of the report that you're ad addressing just so I can reference it? Yes, I would love to, but <laughs> I did not save my highlighted copy apparently. Um, we had upgraded our internet infrastructure so that we had phys more physical connections as well as wireless connections. I, for sure in our high schools, I'm not certain about the other schools. So my question is, it seems to take a long time for student laptops to boot still. Is that more of a hardware issue or a combination or? It, it could be a combination of things. So typically, if you are starting up a computer, it's uh, the actual computer itself, so it could be the age of the computer. I'm not sure which model, um, but in general, uh, what would impact uh, the speed at which a computer starts would be the actual computer itself and the potential connection to to wireless. So uh, we are, as the report notes, you know, we have upgraded our uh, wireless capability. Um, we are up grading uh, student devices, those are on a, a refresh cycle. So it could be a combination uh, of things. And, and if there's a particular uh, concern at a particular building, um, I'm not sure if it's, it's, if it's a, you know, one kind of issue or if you're hearing, uh, if, maybe share a little bit more about what's from, behind the question. I just know yeah. what I hear from my kids, but at Juanita High School, mm -hmm. and maybe it has something to do with construction or maybe it has something to do with um, the kids all logging on at the same time. Um, it's still a slow process to um, boot the computers up. And I'm wondering, because we have upgraded mm -hmm. to, is it, two gigabytes per second mm -hmm. is the capability. Mm -hmm. It was 1.1. 1 .1. And now it's mm -hmm. two. But okay. well, that's the used bandwidth. So the, um, I think the part of the report that you're referring to just for everybody's uh, benefit is on page two of 13, uh, where it speaks to the internet bandwidth and the available district internet bandwidth was tripled actually in 2015 to four gigs um, per second and um, so then those bullets actually speak to the average use, just given the number of devices and so forth. But what I can do is uh, look into if there's something particular, if this is something that's being reported via help desk uh, or you know through, through staff about particular issues right. at Juanita High School. I, I do hear it from teachers as well. Um, and I'm wondering, because I don't get cell phone reception there at all, and I'm sure that's a different issue, but it almost seems to be like a dead zone sometimes. Same problem at Redmond High. So if I'm hearing the issue, the issue is just sort of dealing, is better understanding of how the, what's the startup time, what's that capacity f for the laptops to be able to open Great as way well to as put coverage. It. <laughs> yes. And so that's what mm -hmm. the interest is to find out. Right. Um, this eats up in class time. Well, and I mean, the, the policy we're speaking to is to provide a comprehensive and functional technology infrastructure that addresses needs of staff, students, and community. And so I think this is just getting to what is that yep. startup time and is that mm -hmm. an issue? So it's a, just sort of a question to be able to explore and find out if there's anything to do. Does that work? Yeah, because okay. it seems like we've done some great upgrades and I'm not sure that we're seeing the full benefit mm -hmm. of those upgrades. Thank you. Thank you. Great, is there any other questions on any of those criteria? Otherwise, it's looking good that we'll say we're in compliance, there's no, all right. So then, based on that, the, the only feedback at this point on technology is in regards to that one system and to be able to look into that. Um, so this will then come back on the consent agenda for approval at the next meeting. Does that work? Yeah. I, I feel like we are in compliance, we just have a hiccup. So exactly. I'm, I'm okay if we choose to vote on it, um, to accept it. I, I don't see any reason we can't accept it tonight. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I, I can, I I can take a motion a to approve. I, this. Mine was more, wasn't to get the information. Our process is that it's a first read at this point and then oh. goes on to consent agenda at the on next it. one if there's okay. nothing else. But I'm more than happy to accept let's, it. Uh, let's stick with our process. Okay, so we'll go with that process for now. We can revisit if we want to do that differently. Okay. So our next step is an update on the superintendent search. And so 
I guess that's my role to do at this point in time. As you all know, Dr. Pierce is stepping into a new role at Lake Washington, and we have been in the process of working with Rain Associates, a national search firm, to determine who our next superintendent will be. So the initial inputs were collected and analyzed that last week of April and the first week of May. We had 32 focus groups, um, and about 200 people were involved with those. In addition, we had about 850 surveys um, that came through on the qualities as well as over 500 in regards to sort of a district review in general. All that information in that summary is online on the school district's webpage. Um, if you just go to lwsd.org and then click on the superintendent search tab, it will show a running list of sort of all those things and those documents are online for anybody who is interested. Um, probably the most interesting detail at this point in time is the applications have been out since May 11th. They actually close today. So we will be finishing up at 10 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Rain Associates is in Iowa, so they work on a different time schedule. Um, and then they will begin a screening process um, of going through all those applications that they have received. And then on the 14th, the board will meet in executive session in which to do a screen of those first 10 to 12 client, 10 to 12 candidates. Um, then on the 22nd of June, we will hold semi-finalist interviews. That will also be done in executive session per law. And then the most important piece for the community specifically is the finalist interview where we expect to have three finalists. Um, will be held June 28th, will be a town hall at 5.30 and there'll be a serial town hall. So it will be one candidate at 5.30, another one at 6.30, and another one at 7.30, um, and that it will work that way through. So that will be on the 28th, and then we will go into interviews on that, sat on that Friday, the 29th, with the board, with a goal of being able to announce a superintendent by 5 p.m. that afternoon um, on Friday. So that will be the goal of how it works. Any questions on where we're at from the board, anything I might have forgotten. Go ahead. Just one add, all of the great information that Siri just gave is available on our website too, if you like to read it in text. Yes, and we are updating that regularly after our meetings. Um, so that is a place that you can always go for written information. I would only add that on the 28th, we also have town halls for staff, teachers, classified staff, and principals. Um, and we very much do value their feedback on the uh, uh, candidates. So we're Absolutely. hoping to have good attendance. And from all those, we will collect feedback that then will be summarized quickly and provided to us that Friday morning. So that will be the goal in which to do so. So as I said, it is all on the website and we are excited about possibilities going forward. Saddened to lose our current superintendent at the same time there's opportunity going forward in which to do things, so. Just a quick question yep. on um, how are we letting staff know about the meetings on the 28th? Have we thought, thought through that part of it? I know we've got the town hall down pretty well, but I wanna make sure that all staff know that we would really appreciate if they came to the 28th if they're right. available. And that will be outreaching with, we'll work with Shannon and communications to make sure that information is going out and we'll continue to be doing those communications through the different means. Any other questions? Okay, so that is our superintendent search. Um, next, we have a legislative update from Eric, if you have anything. I skipped, oh, did I just skip the entire consent agenda? I'm sorry. We're done. <laughs> sorry, we've been meeting since three. Um, well, there you go. Now the next one, yes. Our next step is the 2018-2019 board meeting schedule. So it is being presented for review. Yeah, if you could. Uh, so as our uh, typical process every year, uh, superintendent board president uh, put together a schedule for uh, board meeting, study sessions, and meetings for the upcoming year. So uh, Siri and I met, if you look at uh, tab seven, this is the proposed schedule for 1819, um, following our typical pattern, and of course we're always looking at um, our holiday observances, calendar, um, district uh, 
vacation, you know, student vacation schedules, all of those sorts of things. Also look at uh, things like when the NSBA conferences and some of those things. So all of that uh, goes into informing the the meeting schedule. So we're uh, presenting that tonight for the board's review to see if there are any questions um, before we finalize it and uh, get it published for the community. Mark? Yeah, in looking at the uh, uh, notes section of the holidays, uh, it appears, uh, let's see, for Ramadan, there's only one day that's specified, and I think that's a month-long uh, program or celebration for Ramadan. On page uh, two of the uh, district meetings and note of notes. Mm -hmm. Just a thought. It, see, it's only notes. I don't, okay, well, I... Okay, I didn't know perhaps the opening date too, and I don't mm -hmm. see anything for Yom Kippur. Right. Um, and I think the so are, just to, to clarify, yeah. um, you're just noting that what observances are listed there, not conflicts with the no, meeting no, no, schedule. No, 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 I'm not. I'm, okay. I'm just just an mm -hmm. FYI that maybe we ought to take a look to make sure we're not that because we may have slimmed down too much. Yeah, I think the the meeting schedule with notes, and in fact, I'm not sure we have that version in um, in our. It was in the board materials, right? Uh -huh. It's just um, those are. It, that's not intended to be our official. No problem. Okay, um, I just want to make sure. Observances calendar. We do Thank have you. one of those that goes into much right. more detail. Um, that's just notes for the board, so the board is aware that we avoided those dates. Gotcha. Um, intentionally. Gotcha. Sorry for any confusion on that. Is everyone clear as to what that was? Yeah. Okay. Any other review or discussion about those dates? Any issues? So at this point, it will go forward as is. As always, we do sometimes add extra meetings, as we've been doing this month and last month, um, as needed along the way. But this will help to make sure the work gets set up going forward. And our next step is the program reports. Um, so Dr. Pierce, if you could introduce the first one. Great. We have a couple of program reports this evening, and uh, one, the first is on student discipline and restorative practices. So this is an annual uh, update. Some of the information is included in uh, the upcoming EL, but uh, this gives us a chance to highlight some things uh, beyond uh, what's typically in the executive limitation. And then also we do have an additional report tonight, uh, just an update on special education. We did receive the, the WISM report and so we've got had that on on tap tonight to speak to a little bit in the report and then of course I'll follow up with the board and send the actual uh, written report as well this week uh, but first we're going to start with student discipline and restorative practices and Dr. Holman is here for our first report and I'm waiting for the computer to log in <laughs> Fortunately, for that quick login time, we were able to uh, get up and running quickly. <laughs> okay, so tonight's uh, program report is focused on student discipline and restorative practices. Um, this is all about connecting our uh, ends and means, uh, the work we do in evaluating the results we get uh, is directly related to how we accomplish those results for kids in our executive limitations. Um, and this is focused on uh, student learning, uh, the EL6, uh, student learning environment. And this, this is all about students' experience in schools, um, their social emotional learning supports, and how we're approaching that. In our student handbook, we actually have a statement as kind of a direction uh, as we think about ensuring that we have safe, nurturing, and productive learning environments. 
Uh, it states, in order to support safe, nurturing, and productive learning environments, the Lake Washington School District encourages schools to take an instructive, restorative, and corrective approach in regards to student behavior. And it's really in that order that we want to uh, address student behavior. Instructive, restorative, and then corrective if needed. And so the goals to this approach, uh, really number one, to correct inappropriate and unacceptable behavior. And if you think about the uh, best way to deal with a situation, it's the lowest level of involvement needed. And so if we can correct uh, student inappropriate behavior through instruction, uh, then that's the best way to do it because it's providing direction and support for that student and then getting them back into their learning environment so that we're not pulling them out of, out of class uh, for unneeded time. It's about developing empathy for others, accepting responsibility for actions, uh, develop capacity to improve behavior and to repair harm uh, when that's the result of their behavior. Over the last few years, we have talked about restorative practices. Uh, it is part of the conversation we have with administrators. Uh, anytime uh, Matt Gillingham or Director of School Support are talking with school principals about a situation uh, involving uh, inappropriate behavior, uh, understanding restorative practices and how they can actually help to resolve uh, unacceptable behavior and restore that situation, the relationship that was broken is critical. And this is kind of a grid that helps think about where does restorative practices fit within the scheme of all types of discipline. And so if you think about not addressing behavior at all, that's really neglect, neglectful. Um, if you're punitive, that's doing something to a student. If you're permissive, that's kind of doing it for them. And really restorative is the uh, kind of the sweet spot there where you're actually uh, requiring the student to take responsibility for their action and giving them an avenue to repair and restore that so that they're learning from that situation so hopefully they're not involved in that in the future. Some of the different examples of restorative practices, um, restorative justice, uh, conferencing or community truancy boards, uh, that really, that's an opportunity uh, in our community, community truancy boards for students that have unacceptable patterns of behavior to actually have a discussion and a conversation about what is actually affecting uh, this student's inability to attend school and how do we as a community want to provide wraparound supports for that student. Uh, community service, peer juries, uh, circle processes where you're actually having students involved in dialogue and conversation about a situation. These are ways we engage students in the situation rather than just responding to it for them. Uh, Washington State has actually gone through a process to identify social emotional learning benchmarks. And under each one of these standards, there's subcomponents, and I didn't list all of those, but really at a high level, it's about self-awareness, self-management, self-efficacy, social awareness, social management, and social engagement. All of those components come together to have a healthy social emotional uh, student. You've heard discussion and talk about a multi-tiered system of support or MTSS. Our work around behavior and discipline and social emotional learning is directly related to the outcomes we want to have by implementing an MTSS. And so when you think about that first tier of intervention, we call that a universal tier of intervention. And so those are the uh, behavioral strategies or social emotional learning supports that we want to provide for a whole school. Tier two is really uh, students that are exhibiting some level of risk, and so we call those selected uh, interventions, so just some, some students, maybe small group or individual strategies. And then tier three is really for those uh, critical situations needing targeted or intensive support. And I'm gonna talk a little bit at the end in the next steps around some tier two interventions around social emotional learning that we wanna target. Some of the ongoing efforts to increase support for students uh, continue to provide on-site drug and alcohol risk assessments. Uh, we implemented a system where uh, day of 
uh, risk assessments are available to all of our secondary schools, either through Evergreen Health or YES, uh, providing uh, school-based behavioral health and chemical dependency counseling services so that students are receiving those needed interventions at school, uh, implementing uh, social-emotional learning curriculum at all of our elementary schools, and then uh, the board has heard about the, the SBIRT grant uh, through Best Starts for Kids, and we're moving into the second year of that grant program where we're actually going to be implementing uh, the screening, brief intervention, and referral process at our middle schools. When we look at our data, uh, two things jump out to me. One, uh, I'm extremely pleased to see that for all groups, uh, we see uh, a reduction in uh, suspensions. What I also see is that we still have uh, certain, certain student populations that are overrepresented in our data. And so while the trends are positive for all students, you can see that uh, when looking at race, ethnicity, our black, African American, uh, Hispanic, Latino, uh, and and uh, students that are represented by two or more races, they are overrepresented uh, in comparison to uh, white and Asian students. And also when we look at our uh, additional groups, we see that our low income and special education students are overrepresented in comparison to the all category and males uh, represent more of our suspensions than our females. But again, the positive trend here is that all groups overall are seeing a, a decline in suspensions. Looking at some of our healthy youth survey data, again, some um, positive aspects in the healthy youth survey when comparing uh, Lake Washington students to uh, their state peers. Uh, here you can see that Lake Washington students report uh, lower levels of being bullied than their state peers. You can see here that students in Lake Washington report uh, feeling safe at school at higher rates than their peers across the state. And you can see here that Lake Washington students report that they know how, how to handle disagreements, solve problems, and consider effects of decisions and be empathetic at a higher rate than their state peers. And so we know there's always continued work in these areas uh, of discipline practices, of social emotional learning supports for students. Currently, uh, OSPI is in the process of rewriting the discipline rules. We have an idea of what some of those changes are, but they are not finalized. And so uh, when we receive those from OSPI, we will take a look at our administrative policy update that appropriately and provide training for our school administrators on, on those changes. We will be piloting uh, social emotional learning curriculum uh, at our middle schools next year and we're continuing to study what does social emotional learning uh, instruction and support look like at our high schools uh, where we believe there might be a difference between uh, middle school. And then here's those tier two interventions that I was uh, referencing earlier. We know that resources aren't unlimited in this area, and so thinking about uh, how can we best continue to meet more students' needs with the resources we have, and so uh, the idea of really looking at evidence-based practices to provide small group interventions to teach skills, not just one-on-one -on -one crisis support, that's critical as well, but actually teaching students skills uh, in small group with evidence-based practices is critical. And the other is uh, evidence-based uh, around individualized interventions for motivation for students to uh, exhibit expected behaviors. So those are both uh, practices we're looking at to implement at the tier two level. So that is the update for student discipline and social emotional. Thank you. So we'll now have questions. So Director Stewart. Yeah. Um, the Healthy Youth Survey again, uh, the numbers. There we go. Um, what's the, uh, uh, the error rate, I mean, the plus or minus on these numbers? 
for the survey? I mean, there's always a variance of uh, three points, five points, whatever. There is, and I would have to find that. Okay, I believe it's, so it's different for each uh, That's grade I thought level. it would be. But it's so close that I was just curious as to how it fell out with that. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, comments on the report? Director Carlson? I was just going to briefly channel Nancy. Um, the trends in suspension would make her very happy. Um, I agree that uh, it's going the right direction. I agree also that you're pinpointing the right challenges that still need to be addressed uh, over application in specific subgroups. Um, so um, good progress. Progress still to be made. Yep. Thank you. Anything else? I would just echo what Director Carlson said, and to continue actually those additional works in the restorative practices and in that field, the community truancy boards and all that work that's going on is highly beneficial in the long run and being able to have a positive environment for our kids. So thank you for that work. One quick question, the peer juries, is that something that's being implemented or is it just being looked at uh, for the um, restorative justice? So to date, I don't know of any of our schools that are actually implementing yeah, that. Um, peer juries uh, take training of a student group. It takes uh, mm -hmm. a pretty specific high level of trust for that student group. So to date, I don't know of any of our schools that have implemented a peer okay. juries uh, process. It just didn't seem like it would be the uh, easiest thing to implement, to be quite correct. Right. OK, well, thank you very much. And our next program report special education. Great. Yeah, thanks again, uh, John. And I also want to say thank you to Matt Gillingham, who's our director of student services, our director of school support, and our building administrators, because uh, it's been a multi-year collective effort. Uh, and I would speak on behalf of everyone to say that everyone shares the interest of keeping students engaged and in school. And uh, people have been um, putting in a lot of effort towards seeing that trend improving. So thank you to the team. And welcome to Mike Van Orden. And uh, I had mentioned that, uh, I'm not sure if the microphone was on or not, when I mentioned that uh, we did receive the uh, WISM report. And so we wanted to take the opportunity tonight to do a little bit of an update on special education, including the uh, WISM report and um, some of the other uh, efforts that have been underway. Of course, we had a recent study session with the board, but it's been a little while since we've done a report in a board meeting. So I wanted to take the opportunity to do that this evening. And uh, I'll just keep talking until Mike gets the presentation. No, I'm teasing Mike. Yeah. <laughs> While he's preparing, may I suggest that uh, since this, the wisdom report will be basically presented after the one night a month that we have for uh, community input and questions, that perhaps we implement an additional time for the next meeting. So for folks that may have read this, if they have questions, they can come in and ask uh, while he's preparing. What I would like to do, if we can hold that for future agenda items, and if you could bring it up then, that will be beneficial so we can just sort of keep it all in the same place is what I would request. Thank you. No, it will just keep it consistent so people can see what's happening in order to make that. Thank you. Um, so what we wanted to do tonight was to um, give you some updates, um, specifically as Tracy mentioned on the Wisdom Report, and then also some things that have happened since we presented at the board study session in March. And then finally, um, some adjustments that we're making in special education that we mentioned tonight in the study session related to uh, resource allocation that I think will be of interest to the board. 
So before we go into the WISM report, I think it's good just to remind ourselves of uh, our special services department and what happens in our special services department. So there's actually three specific areas that are um, all under that same umbrella. That's special education, as well as 504 under the Americans with Disabilities Act and health services. So a um, large number of people that are working um, in concert um, in different areas of special services. It's also, I Good to remind ourselves of the size of our, um, of our population of students who receive special services as well as uh, 504 services, special education and 504 services. Uh, this is the size I was, my wife and kids go to Mercer Island schools and this is about the same size as the entire school district of Mercer Island. So um, it's a large number of students we're serving with a lot of people who are doing really great work. And so if we look at the staff size, again, about the same number of people as, that you would find in a small district serving in uh, special education and preschool special education. So um, specifically for the WISM report, um, the Washington uh, Integrated System of Monitoring is a, a service provided by OSPI. Um, it really has three goals. One is to work on um, really thinking about program effectiveness, as well as helping us to think about improving results. Ultimately, it measures um, our compliance with special education law, not only um, federal, but state and local, and so and that law and policy. I see it as a foundation for our special education services um, on which we wanna build. So for example, if we're not doing individual education programs correctly, that's a problem, and that we can't get to greater improvements if those aren't in place. Or if we're not using our resources well, financial resources well, or following state law, we have to attend to that before we can attend to program improvements. So really, as I mentioned, this is a foundation and it gives us a baseline um, for which to measure our program and then to build on and improve. So the um, report, the monitoring process involves five critical areas and so what I'll do is I'll give you a very high level overview of each and then as Tracy mentioned, we're sending you the actual report and a summary um, from Paul Vine in our special services department. So the first area that um, the report looks at or the monitoring process looks at is our data monitoring system. So these include things like Skyward, Cedars, IEP Online, the ways we collect and disaggregate data. So many of the um, data presentations we've been sharing with you were reviewed by this review um, group. And really looking at how do you make sense of all of the information in data form in special services and then use that to provide services for students. And so again, there was, um, as they looked at this area, they were saying there were many areas of data collection um, that allowed us to um, do timely identification of compliance and non-compliance, of looking at instructional minutes, um, looking at least restrictive environment and how we calculate that. We have good data sources to collect that. And so again, there was nothing of concern noted here. Um, what you'll see in each of these areas, if there are areas of concern, they'll either identify those as a required action, something we have to address either legally or in policy, or there might be some program improvement efforts that they would have that wouldn't necessarily be required, but something we would wanna consider. And so again, in this area for our data management system and special services, um, we were hitting all of the targets. Fiscal accountability um, in line with um, our other uh, fiscal services as a district, again, um, came across well. We were meeting um, eligibility and compliance um, using the what's local uh, agency maintenance of efforts, how we track what people are doing in our system and how do we make sure that um, the people we're assigning to us, uh, provide services are actually doing it the right way and in the right, um, with the right efforts. Um, we're also looking at how we monitor enrollment because that's a funding stream. And we have procurement processes, for example, when we hire contract agencies and services like that, um, they're actually clearly defined. And so again, no required actions and no recommendations for improvement. Uh, dispute resolution, this area really is more around do you have the right processes in place? It doesn't um, discuss that you, um, you have a certain number of dispute resolutions, though that you'll see is indicated in the report, so you'll see the number of resolutions by year, including um, this year. Uh, but really it talks about if you have um, a dispute or a complaint, that you have the right protocols and processes in place to address it, um, and along with uh, federal and state and um, district policies and legal requirements. And so again here, um, we were found to have had the right processes in place to address um, dispute resolution and there were no program um, improvement efforts recommended. 
The uh, critical area four was broken down into three sections. So the first one was around least restrictive environment. Um, again, here, when we're looking at this, there are, um, I think you've, you may recall from our presentation, we look at three areas. So 80 to 100% um, was one of the top tiers where we say how, um, how many of our students spend at least 80% of their day in a general education setting. Um, for us, that was about 60% on average. There are state targets that um, we're provided with, and so we met our state targets for a least restrictive environment. Now, again, remember, this is a baseline. This doesn't mean that we can't improve um, opportunities for students to be in general education settings. Um, and I think you heard some compelling um, testimony tonight from some of our speakers um, at public comment. So this is an area that we want to work on, and at the same time, we are hitting state targets. Um, we're also looking at options in preschool and some really interesting and good work that will be happening there and that is happening there um, to look at inclusion and inclusive practices um, that will be happening, that is happening currently, but will also be happening next year in partnership with the University of Washington. Um, so as you can see, there were no required actions, but um, again, a recommendation and kind of a commendation too that um, we want to continue continue to work with our preschool programs and continue to build on those. And then there was one area that they um, actually said we were actually being too conservative on the accounting of least restrictive environment, and they said um, we actually were doing a better job than we were reporting. And so that was an area that they just said, make sure you're using the right way, but report it correctly. Then the other area was um, secondary transitions, and so this looks at as students move um, into post-secondary outcomes. Um, we were meeting our state targets for dropout rates. Again, remember we're talking about a baseline. We always wanna be getting our students to graduation and so um, we are meeting state targets but we have higher targets as a district. Um, we also looked, they looked at files to make sure that there were transition components. So that would be things like um, students meeting certain um, benchmarks to make sure they were on track for graduation and there were certain plans for them following graduation. Um, and so we are getting better at that. 93% of the files reviewed had the required components that we needed, whereas our last review was about 76%. Um, in this case, there were two student files they looked at when they see a a student file as they're reviewing and they find a problem um, that needs to be addressed because it wasn't done correctly, they point that out. And so we have until March uh, 1st to get that addressed and uh, um, fixed. Again, a recommendation for um, improvement. Again, this was also one of those areas where it was almost accommodation is that they were very impressed with our transition services um, and our transition academies and want us to continue to work on expanding that. Um, they said there was some real good success there and keep it up. The other area that came up, um, I put a board brief in about on this a few weeks ago. There's a new state calculation for disproportionality. Um, as the review team was looking at our initial data, there's the potential that we may have disproportionality for Hispanic students in the specific learning disability category. That means the number of Hispanic students that are being identified for that. And there, remember, there are 13 qualifying categories in special education. This is one of them. Um, so I will talk in a little bit about how we're going to be addressing that, and then we will be getting more information from OSPI about specific requirements that we have to meet that. I think with the, um, the plans we have in place to address this, we'll probably be uh, reducing that disproportionality pretty significantly within the next few years. And then finally, critical element five, this is really looking at individualized education programs and the documentation and processes that go with that. Again here, they were finding that we were in compliance. In fact, 100% um, in terms of things like making sure that um, the services that are being provided are actually consistent with the recommendations and the evaluation reports. That's what you'd wanna have, right? Or making sure that um, the specifically designed instruction and the services were actually identified in the EIP and that we're, we're following those. So this really was looking across the board at actual individualized education plans, reading through them and then checking to see if services were in place that corresponded, um, and they did find that in, in these cases. Um, there was, again, one student-specific file that needed to be corrected. Also, there was some work around looking at how we identify and make adjustments um, to IEPs, and so there was actually a, a, a process that Paul Vine um, has been looking at and asked the, the monitors to give us some feedback on, and they said that would be a, a good service for us to use, and so that um, recommendation actually came out of a request from Paul Vine to have us consider that. Um, that will allow us to do a better job of making revisions to um, assessments. And then also um, there was some guidance around just making sure that we're continuing to provide information um, in our special education monthly update. So again, recommendation, not a requirement. 
So that was the five-year wisdom report. As I mentioned, you're gonna get a much more de detailed report that has um, all of the information for each of those critical areas, as well as a summary that we um, developed for you to provide some context. We were um, talking with the monitors, and they won't tell you exactly how you um, rank in relation to other schools and districts, but in, informally they were saying, really you're hitting all of the marks in terms of what we're expecting. Um, again, we wanna always be continuously improving, but there were no concerns, no major red flags in terms of our ability to have a, a foundational strong system in place for special education in a number of critical areas, and they were very complimentary of the work. Um, they also commented on our efforts towards multi-tiered systems of support, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. So uh, at our last um, study session on in special education, we gave you some updates for our five-year action plan. Since then, there's been some pretty significant work that's happened in a number of those areas. I wanted to take a few minutes to highlight that. I think it'll relate back to what you, some of what you saw in the wisdom report, as well as some of what John was speaking about tonight, and then also some of the um, budget discussion that we had earlier tonight, that we're allocating resources to match needs in our system. And so each of these um, relate to one or more of those. So as I mentioned earlier, there is um, some indication that we may be seeing some disproportionality in the terms of the number of Hispanic students that are being identified and placed um, into special education services in the specific learning disability category. Um, that's been, across the country, um, an area where we have seen historic disproportionality. And we see it in our district as well. Um, if we look at the, um, our Spanish-speaking English language learners, um, they make up our English language learners make up about 10% of our English language learner population. Um, they make up about 32% of, or 32% of English language learners are in receiving special education services. Um, in general, across our district, about 11% of students receive special education services. So there's over-representation there. We also see in some areas we sometimes have under-representation. And so we're seeing that um, either we're not providing services for some students who may need it, or we're putting students in who may not need services if we had some, a better referral or pre-referral process in place. We see um, similar patterns. I think we've shared this data with you before, but just in terms of if you take even EL out of the picture um, by race and ethnicity, Hispanic students um, are about 10% of our population and about 20% of our special education population as a whole. Um, so again, there you see disproportionality. We're, we're sensing that there's a language component to that as, uh, as well as potentially some other areas. So the way we're looking to address that is through a process called a critical data matrix that rather than gathering more subjective information about students, um, we're actually looking at very specific indicators that come from Steve Gill um, that tell you that there's a likelihood that the issues you're seeing in a classroom that might make you concerned about a student's performance might be more related to language than they would be to a disability. And so those indicators play out where a team will be looking at things like the student's primary language, how many years they've spoken that primary language, um, their literacy in their primary language. For example, if a student is fluent in their native language, both in reading and writing and speaking, that might not be a disability, that might be a language um, attribution issue. So what this does is it points a team before you even start into the referral process to say, you know what, there might be some interventions that are needed before we'd even think about special education. Or say a student was having challenges in their native language that seemed to identify an area of concern, that might indicate um, a need for an assessment for a disability. So this starts to point out some, like I said, evidence-based indicators that would point you in one direction or another, either a disability or a language acquisition challenge. So um, in terms of work that's happening very specifically on this, um, Kelly Pease, Paul Vine, and their teams have been working with our EL teachers and school psychologists to train them in the use of this after they've developed it. Um, we provided our principals with an update on how it works and have they begin started to use this tool in our system. Next year, all of our teachers and principals will be trained in the use of this process, um, as well as, as I mentioned, our um, school psychologists and EL teachers and then there'll be an expectation that people are using this as a pre-referral process, so potentially um, before a guidance team or even in a guidance team meeting, um, wh wherever an EL student is being discussed. Our anticipation then would be that we'd see fewer students that would be referred for special education services and would actually be referred for more interventions with an EL focus. 
So then we also um, shared some information about our multi-tiered systems of support. And just as a reminder, um, we've talked about this a little bit tonight, is that we always want to be thinking about what do we make sure every student in our system has in terms of core instruction, whether it's academic, behavior, social, emotional. And then when students don't respond to that, what supports are available at another tier. And then students that don't respond to evidence-based quality interventions um, have maybe even a more specific intervention or, or program in place. So we're looking at how do we make this more systematic across the system so that it's not dependent on a school or a classroom or a teacher, and we're not asking our um, people in our system to figure out what the interventions are, that we vet the interventions, that we have clear processes to make sure that we're matching students to the right interventions. We believe that if we have a good MTSS system in place, we'll address many of those gaps that we've been talking about. So students receiving special education services, the gaps we're looking at in terms of achievement, non-time graduation, a good MTSS system should help us get there, as well as our English language learners, low-income households, uh, students from low-income households, um, it potentially helps us address racial and ethnic gaps. Uh, it also is a way for us to think about students who are exceeding standard, and we know that Students will have challenges in some areas and will be exceptional in others, and we want to make sure that there are systems in place for them. And we want to also, as I mentioned, make sure that we're bringing in alignment our tiered supports. And so earlier, John was sharing the idea of um, social emotional work at the high school. Uh, Matt Gillingham and I were meeting with the team at Redmond High School to talk about how can we bring evidence-based interventions into the school, um, use them with a team that's monitoring data, incorporate them with fidelity, and then scale those across the whole system so those evidence-based interventions are available to any high school. That's really the idea of bringing alignment to our system. The other thing that uh, I don't think we mentioned in our last study session, but there is some interest as part of our program um, efforts, program improvement efforts, is to use a response to intervention model as a way of identifying students for special education services. So you can say if a student's not responding to core instruction and interventions, there may be a need for um, further assessments. To have that model in place, you have to have a robust MTSS system. So this is um, from OSPI talking about um, the efforts to move to a different way of identifying students from spe for special education services that's different than a discrepancy model when you're looking at performance and other assessment measures. Um, so this is also part of that larger work to think about how do we um, really think about having quality instruction for all of the kids in our system, and then if they're not responding to that, how do we respond as a system? So to get there, um, we are building in a pilot process next year where we're working with um, schools at the elementary, middle, and high school level to start working on trying the interventions that I was mentioning that we want to scale across the system, to have teams at the schools that monitor those systems to make sure they're working at the school level, to have a district team that's monitoring the overall process, and then the goal is over time to build those systems in place. So these are the schools that have um, that we'll be working with next year. Um, there are a number of elementary, secondary, uh, middle, and high school. Each school is going to have a slightly different emphasis based on tiered systems that are already in place in their school and also efforts that they are willing to participate in. So some of our schools will be working on uh, tiered academic supports. That might be tier two reading or math interventions for all students. Um, some are going to be working on behavioral, social, emotional. So for example, I mentioned we visited Redmond High School. They're looking at um, trauma-informed instruction and intervention. And then we're also looking at a group of our schools that are looking at inclusion practices and inclusion as a tier, as part of a tiered support system that all students have access to inclusion. So that'll be um, a number of our elementary schools as well as middle schools. Our assist associate directors are working with us on that as well to start defining what we mean by inclusion, um, start bringing best practices and evidence-based practices into the school settings, and start thinking about our system in some different ways. All of those then ultimately come together and we start working on scaling them up over time. So I'm going to skip ahead to the way we're seeing that play out. So as we've been learning more about MTSS, what we've been hearing is this takes time to build a system of this complexity and this scale. And so we spent this year really learning about MTSS, as I mentioned, with a leadership team. Next year, we're moving into a pilot phase where we work with schools to incremen incrementally develop or improve tiered systems. And then what we learn from those schools, we scale out to other schools. Uh, the following year, then we start to actually implement some of those interventions on those tiered systems at more schools. And then the following year, we start thinking about really measuring the effectiveness of those interventions. So over multiple years, you're building capacity 
capacity in the system without ever saying you're going to have a, the MTSS system in any given year because you're constantly working on improving and refining it. Going th I'm chugging along here, thanks. Um, we also wanted to give you an update on dyslexia because since our last meeting we have identified um, not only curriculum for tier two and tier three, but intervention uh, training for our folks. And so we wanted to give you an update on that. Just a reminder when we're talking about dyslexia, um, this is not something we're talking about as a developmental dyslexia in, in reading. This is a clear um, brain-based challenge that some students have with matching letter sounds to words and letters. Um, taking words apart, putting words together, making sense of words so that they can eventually read fluently and with meaning and understanding. So we know that if you identify and address dyslexia early and you have quality reading instruction in place and you have good interventions, you can address many of the reading challenges that our students with dyslexia face. And also recall we mentioned last meeting we have wonderful new state legislation that gives us guidance around that in terms of identifying and using screening tools, quality interventions, good tier one instruction for all of our students, um, parent communication, so all of those things we're putting in place. Um, and I know there have been some questions about just the pacing and the time. I just wanna say right now, this has gone into a, a very accelerated mode. We've, and I should give credit to where credit's due, Kelly Pease and Paul Vine and their teams have in a very short time put a pretty robust system in place that we think is gonna make a big difference for our kids next year. Um, and so, Definitely understand we've been talking about dyslexia for years and now we're really, I think, moving forward with it. So as I mentioned, we wanna make sure we have good screens to identify students with reading difficulties, including dyslexia. Um, we are going to be using our Dibbles assessment. Um, that's an assessment that was recommended and endorsed by the International Dyslexia Association. The goal of a screen is to identify indicators of dyslexia and students who are at risk for reading difficulties. And as I mentioned, um, our Dibbles assessments and the reading difficulties that students have specifically are around phonemic awareness and uh, sound fluency and things like that. Our Dibbles assessments measure the things we wanna measure to see, to find students who have reading difficulties and who are at risk for dyslexia. Uh, we also are working on, as I mentioned, um, intervention curriculum for students who don't respond to really high quality tier one instruction. And so our team has looked at evidence-based programs with a number of very specific um, requirements that, that programs need to have in place, um, including all of the phonics and phonemic awareness and fluency, vocabulary, comprehension, spelling strategies, as well as assessment tools that are built in to progress monitor students and then um, programs that we can put in place and use effectively in our system because a great program that can't be used by teachers is not a great program. So we wanna make sure that um, it's a program that teachers can use in small groups and with individual students and that we can provide training for and that we can scale across the whole system. So our team reviewed um, three evidence-based programs um, and has landed on one called Systematic Instruction in Phonological Awareness, Phonics and Sight Words, that includes all of the elements that we were looking for in an evidence-based tier two intervention curriculum. Um, as I mentioned, it needs to have a strong phonics component uh, as well as uh, multimodal instruction where kids are actually making associations between letters and sounds uh, that allow them to access language later on. Um, and so they, are, they will be forwarding that recommendation to the board. It's with our Instructional Materials Committee right now. Um, that group included, as I mentioned um, in our board brief earlier, that's a representative group that did that review, including specialists, teachers, administrators, two parents, and we tried to get representative people from all around the district to give us uh, perspectives on the curriculum, and uh, that's where we landed. So that'll be a curriculum that's used as a tier two intervention if you think about that tiered support system. So uh, this is where I was talking about um, some adjustments or some updates since our last meeting. Uh, we are at a point now where we're ready to start implementing. We, are, we will be providing a half day of instruction to all of our K-5 teachers. That includes general education, um, all of our general education teachers and principals um, on dyslexia as well as high quality reading instruction. What needs to be in place in a good tier one system? And by the way, our Wonders curriculum includes the components of an effective tier one reading program that supports kids with reading difficulties, including dyslexia. Um, and we'll also be giving them information about what does a tier two look like. 
We'll also be providing um, district-wide training for K-5 special education teachers and safety net teachers. They'll be our primary interventionists um, around the new curriculum. So when a student's not responding to core instruction, there'll be a special education teacher or a safety net teacher who's trained and equipped to provide um, tier two intervention. And then over the course of the year, there'll be five full days of training for those folks um, to use the, the intervention curriculum effectively and to monitor progress of students. We'll also be working next year on parent information as part of the legislation that I mentioned. Um, and then reviewing um, curriculum and supports for grades three through five because you start to take a slightly different approach in grades three through five. You'll still be working on phonics and phonics-based instruction, but you'll also need to be thinking about modifications and adjustments, as well as vocabulary and um, comprehension. And so in grades three through five, there's some still work to be done. And then finally, we'll be having a written dyslexia framework that's available for everybody in our system to answer questions people have about dyslexia and our approach. So again, I mentioned, uh, I, I recognize that this is something that's been on the radar for a while. This is pretty substantial work that's taking place to get an entire system of teachers um, up to speed, as well as administrators and parents up to speed on addressing dyslexia in our system. The other thing we talked about at our last uh, meeting, and when we're talking about inclusion, we're thinking about co-teaching as a way to um, provide our students in special, who are receiving special education services, and particularly in ELA and math, so in a SLD category, access to the core instruction in a general education setting with their peer and a special education teacher. This is a way of um, doing inclusion. This, rather than having students go out to a resource room, the resource room teacher comes to the general education setting. Um, and when we see this happening, we do see generally better outcomes for kids. And at the secondary level, we have more students that are not in general education setting for 80% or more of the day. So co-teaching is a way to get to this. Um, we do see about 50% of our students, 56% of our students that are in 80% or more of the day, but that means 44, 40 to 44% are not. And so we see co-teaching as a, a real strong strategy to address some of that. So as I mentioned earlier, as we're always thinking about what do we want to get out of these approaches, we want to be thinking about uh, reducing the achievement gap, particularly in ELA and math. Um, improving on-time graduation rates, and so those will be measures we're using to uh, um, measure the progress and effectiveness of co-teaching in our system. And so the goal will be to develop and implement co-teaching across all our secondary schools as part of a multi-tiered system of support. So at our last um, study session, there were a few fewer schools that were participating. Since then, we've been going out directly to schools, meeting with principals and teachers in each school, telling them about co-teaching and the purpose and the why. Um, since then, we've had uh, uh, many more people that are participating as part of co-teaching. So we have schools where co-teaching is already taking place. We have schools where we will be bringing new teachers into co-teaching. And then the goal is to provide training for all of those folks so that we're not only saying put two people in a classroom, but we're giving them the tools and skills to teach, um, co-teach effectively. And so um, each of these schools will either have co-teaching in place and will be part of a, an intensive pilot process or will have teachers participating in co-teaching training. So that pilot process I mentioned will be pretty intensive. We'll be um, providing very specific support not only for teachers and principals, um, that will include a, one of our, some of our specialists from special education and safety net actually going to schools and providing direct support, um, training for our teachers, and planning time as well. We recognize that starting co-teaching is sometimes one of the barriers, and so if teachers have time to prepare and get ready for co-teaching, they can be more successful. And then as I mentioned, we'll be providing additional training for teachers who are already co-teaching. This is, again, one of those areas where we're putting resources and budget capacity to do this work for next year to increase um, inclusion in our schools. In addition, then, we ask that our co-teachers give us something back. So we're asking that they actually use the instructional strategies. Um, they provide feedback to us about how to expand and then make their co-taught classes available for other teachers to see. Because we don't only want to have people that are partnering classes, we want them to be doing it effectively. And so this is part of our efforts to make sure that we're doing co-teaching and we're doing it well. Finally, just the last few things we were mentioning with the, um, some of the reports we were sharing tonight for budget, um, we have some really wonderful things happening in preschool learning centers and middle school math that were part of our program review. Um, we will be providing training for our preschool staff um, with the University of Washington. 
uh, related to new creative curriculum. It's actually, that's the title called Creative Curriculum um, to help improve things like managing materials, working cooperatively, forming friendships, those skills that help kids throughout their educational career. Um, so we're putting resources and time into that. We're also putting time into our learning centers, um, particularly around the uh, picture exchange communication system. We haven't had consistent training and support for that as a way of student, for students to access um, content and curriculum through communication. Uh, we're also looking at providing uh, training in a program called SCERTS, which is uh, social communication, emotional regulation, and transactional support, um, training for teachers around an assessment tool, and as well as um, not only training, but having common uh, Steyer Fitzgerald functional academics curriculum for all of our learning center programs. Um, again, that's been something that has been inconsistent across the district. And then finally, we're looking at um, how do we provide uh, curriculum that gives students access to the core and then also maybe builds in some missing foundational skills. So a student that is four and five years behind in uh, mathematics, there can be replacement curriculum that can fill gaps while they're still accessing the core. And so we'll be working closely with our teachers to use that curriculum, and that will also come to the board in June. And then working with um, consultants to actually provide training for our teachers, our resource room teachers, about really high quality mathematics instruction. Um, because we see that as, if you're going to be providing access to core, you need to be able to provide really high quality instruction to do that. So that would actually carry over into those co-taught classes as well. And then finally, uh, we mentioned a few of these tonight, um, some additional special services updates. Um, we wanted to let you know we're pre we'll be providing um, point one to each of our secondary schools um, to create adaptive PE programs. And so that would be um, programs designed to meet individual needs of students around individual gross motor needs and disability related challenges um, in every school. We, we've known that students in our um, transition centers in our high schools haven't always had access to physical education. This is actually putting uh, people and resources in place to make sure there are physical education opportunities. Um, we also, as we mentioned earlier tonight, um, looking at a lease option with basic beginnings for our Transition Academy 2 um, that will provide a more flexible environment as well as a more central environment to uh, really wonderful experiences for our students. And then finally, um, we are, we'll be upgrading our FMDM equipment for students who are deaf of hard of hearing, and it's just a much more robust, effective um, system that will allow our students to access school and education. So uh, I think the big takeaway tonight is we have a, a special education services department that's doing some solid work. Um, if you talk to neighboring districts, and I've worked in quite a few, when you don't have a special education service department that's providing the basic services, you're not getting to these higher level um, improvements. We also know that there's lots of work to do to improve, and there's been a lot of efforts to get moving in those directions, um, and we recognize there's still much work ahead, but I um, really want to leave with, um, behind all of these things we shared tonight are people that are putting in some pretty significant efforts, and I think putting in efforts in the right ways, um, and we'll continue to do that into next year. Thank you, Mike, and, and before we uh, take any questions, I also uh, just want to thank you uh, for your work in this area. As you know, Mike's been in his position as associate superintendent for just this one year, and so for this one year, he has been overseeing the special services intervention programs and really bringing those efforts together and I think you can see uh, some of the planning work uh, coming to fruition now and uh, I want to really give Mike credit for that as well as Paul and his team and Kelly and her team and really um, kudos to you Mike for bringing that work together and really uh, leading that team to uh, where we are. As you know, there's lots of uh, good work happening. Um, there's things that I think you all know that we have been talking about and planning for that uh, is now coming you know, to fruition, and there's continued work to be done. Mm -hmm. And I'm confident uh, that the work will continue on the positive trajectory that it is uh, under Mike's leadership. So thank you, Mike. Okay, so at this point, we will take any questions. Yes, Director Stewart. Uh, start towards the end, professional development. Mm -hmm. Could you pull up that slide? Especially the one which talked about PECS. PECS has been out and around for, God, at least 10, if not longer. Yeah. Um, why are we not having training sessions for uh, 
the AC devices. I know that uh, um, the, the uh, consultant for Redmond High School comes in once a semester, once a year, something like that, to help the paras learn how to use it. It's more interactive for students and it provides better independence. Should we be having that for the teachers as well? Yes. It seems to me. So uh, we have, as you know, um, two assistive technology specialists. Uh -huh. uh, part of our work with them is starting to talk about what is that common, consistent uh, training for the whole district. So that would be probably something that would fall in there. Where we saw the reason for PECS is because it's a it's a evidence based inner, it's an evidence based form of communication that was being applied inconsistently across the district, and so our goal was to make sure that we had that foundational level of communication. And as you mentioned, there's still work to do around using devices, communication devices as well, um, through our assistive technology specialists. Yeah. You might, as they try to look at uh, instructional ability, uh, your internal AC, AAC people. They might want to uh, work with the folks at uh, Rock Therapeutics that were helping Redmond High School. Uh, if we could go back to the WISM uh, report, mm -hmm. in particular the IEP document uh, assessment, the compliance with uh, is being yeah. carried out. Should put my glasses on to do this. Yeah, that help because you're making me dizzy. <laughs> Here we are. Um, the trying to determine whether or not the IEP document was actually matching the services delivered. Did they ask instructors that it was being delivered? Did they ask parents that it was being delivered? It was a combination of, so first they read the file, then uh -huh. there were classroom visits, discussions with teachers, and I believe, I don't believe there was actually a conversation with a parent to see if the minutes, so, so they, they were actually in the classroom though observing uh -huh. to see if the, the IP was being followed, but also a conversation with the teacher. Okay. Quick question also on WISM. We met the state targets. Sounds like all of them. We have some recommendations. One thing that I've noticed is we usually exceed state requirements by quite a lot. And you mentioned that we weren't able to access information on other districts. Is there any way um, for us to set a goal that exceeds state targets yeah. and actually measure it? Right. So I think to me, when we're, we're talking, for example, I showed you the, in the co-teaching slide, we have the data on each year we calculate LRE. To me, this is a perfect way to measure, do it here, sorry. This is a perfect way for us to measure internally, and we talked earlier about how do we use that PLEA process of constantly evaluating our programs. This is a perfect measure of inclusion oops, just, and co-teaching. Uh, and so if, we're, if we set an internal goal of, okay, we know we have 67% um, in elementary, middle, and high school, and we're working at improving that, then that's a way for us to internally evaluate. So yes, we met targets, and maybe we even did better schools, but I think this is our one of our key measures. Uh, the other thing to note, though, and that, again, incremental, but um, this reflects about a 5% overall increase from the last time we had a WISM review. So, you know, I don't know if that's enough gain, but I think it does show that there have been efforts in place, probably a lot through that, of that co-teaching that's happening, to start improving rates of inclusion. It doesn't get to what we were talking about earlier tonight, was you know, every kid in, in a general education setting 100% of the time, but it, it's a way for us to measure. Uh, I'd like to thank you for being open to suggestions and things that the board has either emailed or discussed in study sessions or board meetings with you. I think it's so important to be able to look at what is available and happening around us and then see if that might work for us. Uh, so I appreciate that. Um, and is the WISM every year, every other year? So we have um, the actual on-site visit is typically mm -hmm. every few years. Okay. Um, so this was a much more, you know, drilling down, actually talking with people in the schools, visiting classrooms, observing. Um, but we do have, we typically have an annual is, check. Is it there a possibility of setting targets 
looking at this graph right now. Um, setting targets, I know you said we increased by 5% over the last mm -hmm. few years. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any targets in mind, or would you? No, and to me, and actually, that's um, that's great. I'm glad you mentioned that. So, part of the work of the MTSS pilot we mentioned in looking at inclusion, and part of our work for co-teaching is to start seeing if we're adjusting the dial here. Um, and so, that would be something that we build into a plan for next year th through the pilot process. What kinds of changes are we seeing, and then start to set goals. Um, the other thing we want to look at is achievement, academic achievement. So, for example, in our co-taught classes, if we have more students in general mm -hmm. education settings, are we making sure that we're getting good achievement gains there as well. So we're looking, I think, when I'm thinking about measures for all of this work we're talking about, this is one I'm thinking about. Academic achievement for our students in those settings is another one I'm thinking about. Uh, and then also the impl ap actual application of practices. Are we seeing changes in practice on the part of teachers? So there's lots of measures that we need to build into program efforts. So, Director Carlson. Yep. Um, is, is, is WISM our sole metric on, uh, it's not. No. I mean, we, we've got the academic outcomes. What I'm, what I'm really wondering about, though, is the, the parental engagement mm -hmm. department um, and where does that fall into this system? Uh, because it's, of all of our subpopulations of students, this is probably the one with parents who are the most engaged in a specific student's experience mm -hmm. and at the same time the most overworked underpaid assistance you'll ever have mm -hmm. and i am really curious about how do we measure that how do we deal with because wisdom is more or less as i understand it here about compliance with idea which is fine and dandy, but it's kind of dry and boring, and it mm -hmm. certainly doesn't get to the, you know, the the success of the system for supporting parents or Correct. causing them more right. anxiety. Yeah. And I'm just curious about how do we address that piece of this outside yeah. of this? The initial conversation we've been having is there is a WISM parent survey that goes out. Uh, and there are probably indicators in that that we, so even though we might be doing that every few years, uh, the initial conversations I've been having with Paul is, can we pull some, um, some of the items from that that we think are high interest, high value, and then do those annually? Mm -hmm. So that would allow us to see our parents more satisfied with the services their students are receiving. Do they feel like um, the students, their child's needs are being met? Um, those kinds of things. So I think that would be our next step. That survey is coming in in September. Um, there was some challenges with them getting all of their data collection processes in place. But to me, that was what we were thinking of as a starting point. Great, thanks. And just a quick note on that as well. In the five-year action plan, um, yeah, there was the wisdom survey. There's a, a component of uh, parent engagement as well, and mm -hmm. so that's something that we could follow right. back up on yeah. in terms of um, where we are with with that component. And having just read that, it did definitely have it had actually a scaling and a score and. Mm -hmm and across the board. So it was it had a national standard to hit and then what you did above that. So it seems like yep. a very valuable option yep. to be looking at. Okay, before Director Stewart, I'm gonna say it. Okay, Director Stewart. Uh, back to the IEP uh, report, part of the wisdom report. Um, how many classes or cases uh, from the, uh, of the students did they actually go and observe the uh, carry out of the IP, and I assume that they were probably were pre-announced that they were going to be there. Yes, that day. Uh, all right, yeah, I hear what you're saying. Um, Not exactly I'm what I call see, a staff inspection. It's kind of something you can prepare yeah, I for. Think it's a, we have it in the report. I'm not seeing it right away, but so it does have the number. I hear what you're saying, though. Does it? Do you get a, a basically an ob observer effect, right? Or yeah. Is there a change in behavior? Because well, of you also get a uh, have a if someone knows that you're coming in to observe a patient or pardon me, student A or student B, uh, the uh, folks the staff can then look at their IEPs and make sure mm -hmm. that they. Uh, target that day's instruction to the IEP. Yeah, I don't know if it was so much that because they didn't know what specifically they were looking at, if they were looking okay. at a specific service, but I, I definitely hear Just wanted to yeah. ask. Also, um, having sat through the parent conversation with OSPI, I really would 
uh, I'm shocked that there is no parent input on the IEP matching the services delivered uh, because at that meeting, and it was well attended, there wasn't a positive comment about IEPs being carried out. Mm -hmm. And you should be aware of it. Yeah, I, there I is a, There is a major discontent in the district with uh, IEPs being uh, followed up on, delivered, uh, data being collected on students, not being collected on students. So I think that's part, the, the WISM survey that goes out to families actually represents, get, selects a broader cross right. section. So I you know we want to remember we have 3,600 students in our district and probably over 1,000 families. And so we want to make sure we're representing the whole breadth of mm -hmm. the experience. I definitely hear there are some folks that feel the need to come in and speak to that and we need to make sure we're connecting with them. Mike, do you know how many parents were in attendance at that meeting? I think we had, Mark, you were there. I think it was probably 20 around, if I remember correctly. Yeah, about, about 20, is mm -hmm. that what you said? Yeah. 20 to 30, potentially? Mm -hmm. Thank you. In, in just listening to the to the discussion, there's just, I think there's just that underlying piece of how yeah. do we ensure the parent yes. piece. So yeah. I think that's I probably the bigger picture issue to think about. Being that this was a monitoring activity, that's a very different, different thing right. when you monitor, yeah. when then you do program improvement. Um, and so you're sort of under how they monitor and then the program. So that's so that would be sort of the takeaway, yeah. I think I would take yeah. from this discussion in regards to the how do you ensure the parent feedback and incorporation. Mm -hmm. yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I, I think, like I said, to have a broader sample to see, you know, what's the scale, where are we seeing the challenges will allow us to home in on the specific issues uh, that we might be seeing. And, Director of Liberty, you had something. Uh, so uh, my question is about the dyslexia curriculum and particularly yeah. the professional development. Uh, slide 34, I don't know if yours are, if you can see that. Yeah, 34. Um, you have the timeline for all the work we're gonna be doing for professional development. The one part that's missing that if you want to talk about is how are we going to be evaluating oh, that yeah. and then feeding yeah. it back through. So that goes back to, this okay. um, so students that we're seeing well below uh, with pretty significant reading challenges many of whom may have dyslexia and so if we start to see a change in that that's one of the metrics okay. um, then specifically the students in the intervention groups in tier two will be monitored you know at least every two to three weeks potentially more frequently we'll see that they're actually starting to acquire those those phonetic skills so you know um, you know, phonemic awareness, um, the ability to segment words into parts and blend them back together, their fluency, and ultimately their comprehension. So if those things are in place, you're starting to get kids on track. Um, so those are built in not only to dibbles, but then the curriculum itself has assessment tools that allow you to track student progress. So to me, that's the ultimate measure, is if students are able to read, um, you're addressing the challenge, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, and I just have a few other comments from, first off, thank you for that review. Um, there shows to be a lot of work that's going on in putting things into place, um, especially pleased with dyslexia. Having a daughter who had dyslexia going through the school, it's, it's great to see this start to come through. She unfortunately didn't get to benefit, mm -hmm. um, but she did graduate from college with those benefits. At the same time, we heard a lot about universally Mm -hmm. designed learning this evening, and yeah. I didn't hear any of that expressed there. I was probably first exposed to it through Colorado State University yeah. where my daughter went. Right. Um, and so it would be interesting to see how that lays out. From my understanding of a lot of it, that's many of the accommodations I might see on a yeah. 504 IEP. Yeah. When If we could just build it in as a teaching practice, it would definitely be something. So I guess that would be a question that I would have is how that would fit. Um, I would also ask, you would mentioned that this was a foundational level, and then, of course, it's a monitoring report. So yeah. the next step then is, and you've laid out well where we're going with that. So that was very beneficial. Um, when we speak of the parents and some of the challenge of that feedback, um, I had the opportunity to attend the National School Board Association, and they spoke to educational ombudsmen. Mm -hmm. And the idea of that being an informal dispute resolution process. Um, and I would say, and that covers the gamut, but they did mention that special education often was one of those, and they played a key role in being able to 
troubleshoot and actually work with parents um, to sort of say, here are, here are options. They might do shuttle diplomacy. Mm -hmm. it, it might be something to look at as, as another means of trying to address some of those disagreements that occur, but outside the formal mm -hmm. system that our special education system yeah. provides. So yeah. that's just, it'd be something I'd toss out there as something to think about going forward. I know Portland is doing it currently. Mm -hmm. DC has one. Um, it was, I, it was a fascinating concept, so I just wanted to throw that out there as you speak about this. Um, can I go back to the u universal design for a little bit? Yes, So sorry. two areas, um, specifically through the pilot process, that's something we're seeing building into the schools that are looking at the inclusion strategies, as well as um, work that we'll be doing with our associate directors. And then the other area um, is the technology component. So I'm working with uh, Mindy Mallon and uh, Debbie uh, Wagner, who oversee technology specialists, and having them integrate their work more coherently because um, there are some nice things in technology that make um, content more accessible to kids, help teachers manage UDL, um, and so we see some real potential there as well. Oh, that's fabulous. Um, technology can do a lot in accessing those things. The one last piece that I had was, and now of course I've lost it on my, my piece of paper here. So I'll bring it up at another point in time when I remember it. So. But thank you very much on the, the update. I think that was very informative and provided a good overview. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of work going on, and, and it's clear that do. staff is doing a lot. Um, I now just remembered. I knew if I waited just a little longer, I'd get there. <laughs> From the board level, the question that I asked to the board, actually, is there is a lot of things for us to learn at the same time. So I think of the co-teaching that's going on, um, the possibilities. You mentioned going into classrooms. I had the opportunity to visit Kelly P's in classrooms where they're doing co-teaching with EL. So that was very helpful for my to just understand the value of that and how it worked. Um, so is there some learning for the board to do in this area, either through linkage, through visiting, through those pieces that we can learn a little more to be able to address these more? And if there's policy things that then we want to look at and pay attention to. So I'm sort of putting that out to the board as something to think about. Uh, in that vein, uh, to that degree, the, the school system down in Oregon that everyone is starting to look at that has a very great inclusion model and some other aspects, I'd like to, to suggest a, uh, uh, a tour of their uh, work uh, with board members, staff, whoever. I mean, a combination to be quite frank. It's uh, great and already uh, beginning to be underway. So Mike, do you want to I, just- I thought it would be. I, thought, I wanted to make sure to it got me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, um, we are. We're working on coordinating a, uh, a visit with uh, West Lynn Wilsonville. Uh, I think the question that we're working on is they have two weeks of school left and we want to have a representative group do the visit. And so um, we'll be doing some work this Wednesday with some of our MTSS team to see if we can get a team there before they're done or if we want to do it in the fall. Uh, because I think we also want to think about the questions we want to ask and what we want to look for and just be really uh, prepared. So it might be a smaller team that goes sooner than later or it might be we wait until the fall. But yeah, I think it's not only that's uh, West Lynn, but I think there's some probably other places we could look at as well. And I think your idea of uh, having scheduled visits to visit some of our uh -huh. classrooms as well mm -hmm. is fabulous. Yeah. Uh, I think your question was, is that something the board, board should do as a, as a board rather than individual board members? Is that right? Am I, am I understanding that correctly? Ideally, yes, that there's a concentrated concept of going forward and really doing targeted, that we all get an experience so that we all understand that same concept. Um, there's a lot of framework for that to be able to be of value when we hold these discussions that then we can better understand I, all those components. I think it's a great idea. I mean, as everyone watching you at home could probably tell, there's a wide degree of uh, knowledge on this board of how our SPED program works and what some uh, best practices are and what we're doing in the classroom. I think it'd be helpful for the board to all be on the same, you know, be on a similar um, playing field when we're having these discussions. I think it's a really great idea. I, um, I don't know how we build it into the work plan in the immediate term, but I support doing that. Uh, I I would not see it in the median term as in this school year. I see but it as something we can look at for the incoming <laughs> school year and be able to build that through and be able to think about that. two weeks or so, right? Mm -hmm. It's not going to happen. Okay. <laughs> yeah, not this fortnight. So that sounds like something yes. that we should put on. Okay, uh, I just wanted to put that out there. I, Any other questions? Well, I was just going to say that 
that sounds like something that probably takes place during the school day, <laughs> which is a little bit harder for some of us than others. I am perfectly happy to do homework that involves reading, but homework that involves not being at my real job is expensive. Absolutely. I guess the goal would be to set the opportunities for people to be able to participate. And if you can't, that's okay. We can always debrief that and bring that through. Not all of us attend the conferences, but yet we can bring that information back to share. Agreed. Okay. Anything else on special education on these program reports? All right, well, thank you very yeah. much for all your work. It's Thanks. clear it's been a busy year. Um, it's good. It's and good it will work. continue to yeah. be busy years. It will. So, appreciate all that work. Now we still have one more report to go. We do. So thanks again, Mike. And uh, Barbara is going to going to make her way forward. Uh, we have been uh, building in a series of facility reports, so we can provide you with updates on our 2016 bond project. So that's what Barbara is going to do tonight. And and look at that. The presentation's ready to go. It is. That's so excellent. Exciting. <laughs> thanks for thanks for Mike helping me. All right. All right. So we last uh, gave a report to the board in January. So uh, I wanted to uh, update you on our bond projects because our buildings are getting. There's lots of uh, new pictures to show you, and I think it's exciting the progress that's being made on our new schools. So um, our building on success program continues, and as you know, we are uh, working on eight projects across the district. Um, the first project is our Juanita High School rebuild and enlarge project, and just uh, that is scheduled to open in the fall of September, uh, fall of 2020, and it is a phased project. Um, and so just, uh, giving you some accomplishments uh, since the last report, since January. Um, site work began in April. Um, we have installed temporary portables that are going to be needed um, because they're going to, last summer they demolished a portion of the classrooms. This summer they will be demolishing another set of classrooms and the performing arts wing. Um, the other thing is we uh, worked uh, with our city of Kirkland and they have issued the building permit and they have also approved uh, construction of temporary parking lots and the good news is the temporary parking lot for students and staff will be um, completed and open by the end of this week. So they uh, moved really fast on that and that's, that's great. Um, so and then just upcoming this summer, as I mentioned, the demolition of uh, classes, classrooms. No class is will be demolished in this process. Um, so there's just an artist rendering. Here's some pictures of uh, rebar reinforcement and underground electrical conduit is at the bottom left there. And then the um, bottom right is just an aerial photo showing the outline of the new building taking shape. And this, uh, the orange area is the construction area, and then the red area is the temporary parking on the left. It's hard to read, uh, but that's for the Juanita staff. And then the red area on the bottom is for the construction personnel. So the next project, uh, Claire Barton Elementary School, that's our new elementary school in North Redmond, uh, scheduled to open this September. So we have, uh, in that project, we completed or this in May, yes, we completed the interior installation, um, exterior concrete and asphalt is being installed, and the cover play area and the ball wall was completed um, in May. And then, so we is, uh, expect to have substantial completion of this building this month, um, and the furniture will be moved in in July and school for school to open in September. 
Here's some pictures. The um, top left is the main entrance. Uh, the top right just kind of uh, shows the windows. They will have operable windows that can open. Uh, the bottom left is shows a shot out to the shared learning area into the classroom. And then the bottom right photo is the ball wall. So Ella Baker, uh, the new elementary school in Redmond Ridge East also planned to open in fall of 18. And just some accomplishments there. Um, the uh, Puget Sound Energy has energized the power and uh, that's a good thing to have power. Um, the play area and the ball wall is complete. All staff had a site visit, or the planning staff had a site visit uh, last month, and the interior finishes and the casework um, installation began in May, um, and that will be complete in June. And this school, we will have um, the administration, the first floor the administration offices will be um, complete uh, in the commons gym and kitchen probably will be complete even though I put in July and then substantial completion for the whole building is August. So just some additional pictures. The um, top left is the front door entry um, and the top right is a classroom flooring being installed. Um, the lower left is the casework installation. Um, and the lower right is the gymnasium equipment being installed. So our new middle school in Redmond Ridge, which is scheduled to open in September of 2019. Uh, we selected the planning principal, Heidi Paul, in April. And so that's very exciting. And they are completing the roofing on the classroom wing and beginning the in-wall inspection. So the electrical inspection is completed. Um, they're starting this month. Um, again, Puget Sound Energy is energizing the power and site work and landscaping in the sports field is beginning. And the building envelope will be complete in August, which means it's um, closed to weather. So. So just some pictures, the top, that's the west, the building view from the bus loop. Um, the bottom left is the project, uh, just a picture of um, staff visiting the project. And um, bottom white, right, sorry, is the um, wing exterior progress. So the classroom wing, so. And then just some more, um, construction pictures and framework pictures. So Peter Kirk Elementary, our um, expansion of uh, Peter Kirk Elementary School to be open in September of 2019. Um, construction began, we had our groundbreaking ceremony in March and site work and construction began in April. We are finishing up the bid packaging and they are beginning in this month to do the building foundation and geothermal wells. It's just the schematic design. Margaret Mead also um, ex uh, rebuild an expansion project opening in fall of September 19. Uh, also had its groundbreaking ceremony in March and they began construction. Uh, they did clearing and grading in process in April and uh, the building permit issuance is anticipated in June and they are also doing the foundation the geothermal well this month. Is there a schematic design? Old Redmond Schoolhouse, that is our project where we are will be housing preschool classrooms uh, scheduled to open in fall of 2019. Uh, we, the building was turned over from the city of Redmond on May 1st. Um, we've been working with the city to get permits. Uh, we are currently advertising uh, to bid on the construction project and construction is expected to begin in July um, or August. Those are just pictures of the exterior of the building. And Explorer, um, part of the uh, bond project, as you know, that project was completed this fall and we are expecting to close out the project this month. 
So just a reminder of the program, just giving you an update on the program costs. Um, we monitor the project costs and estimates on a regular basis. Uh, we are experiencing in the Puget Sound the third most expensive construction market in the nation, and uh, no, no uh, outlook that that's changing anytime soon. Um, but our team uh, in facilities and our um, construction partners and GCCM partners have done a fabulous job of of um, in our design advisory uh, committee have done a fabulous job of value engineering and and offsetting um, finding construction efficiencies to offset to mitigate some of this escalation. So our bond program um, does include a 19 point. 9 million of program contingency, which we are using to cover fiber network, um, but site specific issues and inflation, and also to offset our jurisdictional requirements, market conditions, and unforeseen impacts. Um, we are, in addition, we are expecting to earn um, 3 million more in interest earnings and have received 7 million more in impact fees than originally estimated. We, um, our program funding does depend on receipt of state construction assistance funds. That was planned at $21 million. We um, do not yet have official approval of that from OSPI, though that is expected in July. So we will have the final approval amount hopefully in the next few months. Um, those funds, though, are received once we, we have to spend the money first and then uh, request reimbursement. So um, we're just keeping an eye on the cash flow and making making sure that um, that will all uh, work out. And then our individual project contingency it will be used to offset those market conditions, and but it does create challenges for any unforeseen events. So um, communication. Uh, this year, we had an informational mailer sent to all households in September. We have regular bond e-news updates, so online newsletters uh, showing progress on all of our projects. Those are sent out on a regular basis. Um, we've done 14 Facebook Live broadcasts. The last two were related to the groundbreaking ceremonies at Mead and Kirk. Um, over 46,000 views on those Facebook Live. Um, as I mentioned, the groundbreaking ceremonies at Mead and Kirk. Um, we have an answer to fre uh, frequently asked questions, specifically related to wanting to high school, and then we're um, I don't know how, if you've gone out to the website recently, but all of our projects have updates and videos um, on, on the status of each of their projects. So um, we're always posting um, video stories on our projects. So here, and you can go to our Building on Success page and get more information. So that is my update. Any questions? Barbara, uh, before we take any questions, just a couple of things. I want to say thank you You're for uh, your leadership and for Forrest's uh, leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, it's you know great to see with this number of projects underway that things are on target, on time, on track, uh, yep. progressing as expected. When there mm -hmm. are challenges, the team works collaboratively with the jurisdiction to overcome mm -hmm. that challenge, and we do mm -hmm. appreciate our our city partners and in, in uh, their help and support uh, because these are critical projects mm -hmm. and uh, while we have these eight projects mm -hmm. underway thanks to the support of our community and our voters I also just think it's a good reminder to everybody that this was part one of yes. a, a long-term mm -hmm. uh, program that we need uh, because we need to continue to keep building schools to keep pace with our growth and uh, you know, more to come on that. There has been some discussion at the board level, as you all know, a couple of study sessions just in terms of next steps and timeline. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I just want to again say thank you to the community and again remind everybody that uh, there's still continued work ahead and also uh, give a, a thanks to Shannon mm -hmm. and her team for all the great mm -hmm. communication. So when you think about uh, just all of this follow-up communication and all the Facebook Live and all of those things, um, that, that's something that uh, is new for mm -hmm. us, uh, relatively speaking. I mean, we haven't had the opportunity to do all those great things before, and John Noor and his work with the videographer 
photography. So it's just, um, mm -hmm. it, it's a great communication tool to loop back with our community to mm -hmm. make uh, clear to them that mm -hmm. we're fulfilling the promise and, uh, you know, they supported us and we want to make sure mm -hmm. that they're getting the information back about our, our progress. So right. yeah. just a quick yeah. thank you before we take any questions. Great. I appreciate that. And yeah, and our team, it's not many school districts around the state that are opening six projects in three years. So it's a, it's a big challenge and, and, uh, and everybody has responded, um, wonderfully. So. Okay. Director Stewart. Yes. I want to say Anyone who doesn't drive by one of those projects on a weekly basis, if you do, it's amazing how much goes up so quickly because I mm -hmm. go by the new middle school about once a week and I'm just blown away uh, the progress they're making. That's one of the, the information about the increased uh, amount of impact fees we receive. Mm -hmm. That's been, I know, a criticism by some of the folks out in the community about not getting enough impact fees and so forth. And I'm wondering, uh, since we uh, it was six million we didn't anticipate is it because there's been some new housing or did one of the districts uh, create new rates so mm -hmm. what's i'm just curious that's great um well about ha three million of the impact fees were um uh think funds that we plan to spend on um, phase two of our modernization program okay. and once we closed out those projects we okay. had some leftover impact fees um and and our um so and then uh, so that was about three million of that, and then the balance of four million is um, when we when we planned our program budget. Also, we don't want to overestimate right. what we're going to okay. bring in. So we estimate, you know, conservatively, right. and then. Um, and then, so we have seen the, because of the growth in construction, we have seen more impact fees received from the jurisdictions. Okay. But we're continuing to monitor that um, so that we're not, you know, overestimating. No, I, just, so. I was curious, it seems like all of a sudden we had a jump and I thought perhaps uh, someone had kindly raised their impact fees or something. No. Hi. Any other questions about facilities and things? I have one quick follow-up just from a thing you had mentioned with the school construction assistance program, that you have to spend the money mm -hmm. and then receive reimbursement and Correct. the challenge that places with right. cash flow. I assume that's part of the legislation and the law. Mm -hmm. um, has there been any work to look at how we shift that? And again, that's one of those things mm -hmm. I would think if it's creating challenges mm -hmm. for districts, we're not the only one. I'm sure this is around the state, right. um, especially with all the buildings. So that might be something to think about from right. a legislative side to at least bring that up. Is there a way to change that? that doesn't negatively impact the state, but then can benefit all our right. districts. And, and the program is you have to have local secured funding for the state to even match that. And, and because, and we are getting state match, we don't get state match on our new construction projects, which are the projects right. we built first. So we're receiving state match on Juanita, Mead, and Kirk, which are the projects that are coming at the end of the bond program. So that's the other, you know, but we certainly can continue to work with our legislators to see if there is a different way of receiving those funds, because okay. because you're right. It you know, um, for those districts that that don't have capital levies and and you know, right, it's a much bigger so, impact. So it yes. might be a good story to work mm -hmm. on to tell. So, mm -hmm. but thank you for the update. That is a lot of work going on, and it's a tough environment to be building mm -hmm. right now, especially from a cost containment. Yep. So. Nicely done. I think that's, that's it, and we are now on to a legislative update, if there is one. Yeah, um, briefly. Okay. Well, actually, can we? So the next one, the f next items on the agenda is our next study session or potential new meeting yes. date. You want to tackle that first, and then we I'll jump back. Does that work? Here's what we can hear. Here's what. In discussion with, with Eric and looking around the legislative priorities that we have set, there was a discussion as we looked through sort of the work plan for the end of our year, that in order to really do the legislative priorities and before the legislative assembly that WASDA holds where we set priorities as a state, um, we needed to possibly add a work session in August. So we currently have August 7th as a board meeting and so this would then be August 21st, if I remember correctly. Um, and that would be specifically to focus on sort of the legislative piece with WASDA 
um, and setting those priorities so that Eric can go to Ledge Assembly prepared and ready to speak as our board. Does that give us enough time? Yes, so okay. thank you. Sure. Perfect transition question, Mark, thank you. So the, uh, the Legislative Assembly is September 22. Uh, so what I'll be, I, before this, this proposed August meeting, uh, my, I, my goal, no, my commitment is to bring to the board two weeks prior to it a draft set of priorities for us that we can then work from and um, I think it'll just make it a little easier to move through. Uh, so that would be if we're doing August, give me the date again. 21st. 21st. Oh, it's 20th the Monday? Then 20th, so it must be the 6th of the board meeting. So what? So uh, 20, whatever it may be, two weeks prior to that, I'll circulate um, uh, proposed priorities. We'll be receiving from WASDA in, it looks like it's going to be in mid-July, the uh, proposals that were received uh, that are under consideration for the Legislative Assembly. So that will give us an opportunity to discuss at the August meeting. We then have one more board meeting before the Legislative Assembly in September. So if need be, we can, uh, I'd like the board to uh, you know, approve the priorities before I go there. If need be, we can approve them at the uh, later September meeting on a consent agenda or something like that. All right, did you catch that? Yes. I Sorry, I went rogue a little bit there. I'm just throwing ideas out. It's okay. Okay. So the goal will be that, yes, we'll have the chance to approve them all we prior. Exactly. Could we figure what date that was? And so we have it. So right now we had said August 20th, and I apologize, that's only one week after our board meeting, because our board meeting is actually the 13th, not the 6th. Um, does that matter to anybody if we did that? No. I would anticipate okay. we'd be having a number of new board meetings. Our <laughs> thought was possibly also with the hiring of a new superintendent, there would definitely be a good opportunity to be able to build some of that. So having that extra meeting already scheduled in was a good idea. That was our other rationale. And then the, the last piece before I wrap up is the idea is that these priorities that we will be adopting will not just inform our work at the Legislative Assembly, but our discussions, they will be the framework for our discussions that we'll then be scheduling with our uh, legislative representatives prior to the session. So that's the idea. Thank you. All on board where we're going with that? Mm -hmm. Okay. So we'll update that work plan and put that onto the schedule, okay? Next is any board follow-up? Future agenda items. Yes, go ahead. Oops, sorry. Uh, given the fact that the wisdom report will come out after uh, the one scheduled per month uh, uh, public comment, I'd like to suggest we have set aside five, 10 minutes for public comment for those people that might get a chance to read that over the, uh, when it's online. I assume that part of it is gonna be online uh, before the next, for the next meeting. So if I'm understanding you're requesting that we have public comment at the June 25th meeting is what the request is. There already is public comment scheduled because it's a normal meeting. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought it was, oh, okay, because I thought it was only the first of the month, so that. No, so luckily your issue is already addressed, so there will be public comment at the June 25th meeting um, that anybody is welcome to attend. Also feel free to email. Feel free to do, in, that is also helpful. Um, even ahead of time is beneficial. So that is addressed. Any other future agenda items? Okay, then last we have any board member comments. I would like to share one. I got to attend the celebration ceremony of our Native American along with Director Stewart and Dr. Pierce. Mike Van Orden was also there. Um, again, just Mary Wilbur is who runs that program. It's a consortium with three different districts. It is an incredible work that she does in building community. I think she said 80 tribes were represented within that group. Um, and it is phenomenal. So they got to recognize their seniors who were graduating. Um, and so if you get the chance next year when this comes up, I'd highly recommend you get the chance to go. It was a very positive, uplifting experience and very community. It was phenomenal. Actually, I got to meet a cousin who I didn't know I had, whose daughter was graduating from that program. So happened to have the name Bleasner. There's not a lot of us. So. Just wanted to share that so that you all know. So, and we are in graduation season, so many are coming up. Transition Academy is coming up on Thursday, and then we start moving into many of them coming forward. 
So lastly, we do have an upcoming board meetings. We do have the special board meeting on the 14th, which is an executive session for the board, which will be the purpose of conducting our evaluate qualifications of an applicant. Um, June 22nd will also be an executive session with the board on the semi-finalist piece, and then we will ideally take action afterwards to select the superintendent finalists. We will then have a meeting June 25th, which is our regular board meeting. That's when the public comment will be available to be able to do so. And then on June 29th and 28th and 29th, we will have the events on the 28th for the superintendent search. And then on the 29th, we'll be doing the interviews with the goals of announcing a finalist at the very end. Any questions on those? That is all posted on our website as well. So if you forget, you can find it there. Diane also knows, it's great. You can email her. With that, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. It has been moved by Director La Liberty and seconded by Director Collison to adjourn the meeting. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Oh, we all want to go. Meeting is adjourned.